Crispin Sartwell, it's good to see you again. Likewise, Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, to the uh, Sophia audience, welcome. Uh, I'm here once again with uh, Crispin Sartwell. We are here to discuss his magnificent and, and magisterial book, Entanglements, a System of Philosophy. Um, and uh, Dr. Sartwell has very kindly agreed to do two discussions on the book. Uh, given that there's simply no way to give it any kind of adequate treatment in 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 uh, in one dialogue, I feel like we won't even give it an adequate treatment in two. But I hope that we'll have given enough of it that people who will be interested and in will buy the book and you know all of that. Um, so, Crispin, we we left off last time. Um, I, I think I don't know whether I said to the audience or just to you privately that. I wanted to um, to do a little bit on GE Moore, your stuff on GE Moore, um, before sure. we switch over to the discussion on value. Yeah, I mean, let me just say that Moore shows up over and over again in this book, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I really, until I started working on it, I didn't realize how much I love GE Moore and how much I'd gotten out of him back in the day and stuff, so. Well, and, and I, always, I always notice when somebody really expresses admiration for something or someone that is pretty widely mocked and ridiculed. And I actually published an essay on Moore myself. Um, and I think I started off with some expression like, you know, if, if you wanted to, if you were talking to a bunch of philosophers and asked, you know, what's the worst argument in the history of philosophy? <laughs> it would yeah. tell you that Moore's proof of the existence of an external world is the worst argument in the history of philosophy. Right. Um, I love it, man. I think it's decisive. Right, right. I know. It's, uh, so, um, <laughs> Um, so let's, um, let's uh, just talk a little bit about how you use more, uh, in the book. Um, oh, and I, I, gosh, I'm such an ass. I forgot to do introductions. Um, uh, I'm Dan Coffin. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State. I'm the host of the Sophia program on blogging heads, which by now I'm sure most pe people in the audience know. You are Dr. Crispin Sartwell. Other than being a writer of this book, you are... Professor at Dickinson College in Carlisle, PA. And what kind of school is Dickinson? Actually? It's a small. It's a small liberal arts college. Liberal arts you college. Know? Yeah, yeah. We Two thousand students, something like that. You know, uh, totally undergraduate. Also, why don't you give a little plug? Um, you just told me this morning that you've got a piece in the Wall Street Journal. Why don't you give a little plug for that, and and we'll link right. to it also uh, in the uh, yeah. I've had, I've had a little run in there lately, four or five pieces. Uh, this one's on Thoreau's birthday, which is today, uh, arguing that he's neither on the political left nor on the political right, and that's a good thing about him. And that does engage with, like, the political philosophy uh, chapter of the book as which well. Which we are going to talk about today. So um, um, what, have you been doing a series for them, or is it just a coincidence uh, that they've, you've done a bunch of pieces lately? It's a, yeah, I guess they're occasional. I mean, it's not... I don't have any regular arrangement with them, but you know, I guess the editor mm. likes my stuff or whatever. So, so they cut when they, when there's things they want to do that they think you're, they've got you on a list and they sort of call you up and say, Hey, could you do something on this? Or do you send them stuff? I send them stuff. <clears throat> I mean, I think that the editor, the opinion editor there might've been sort of a fan of mine, believe it or not, this, my op-ed stuff from the nineties and early two thousands. Uh, in particular, an argument. I remember he sent me a little letter after I wrote an argument uh, refuting the existence of Al Gore. He liked that one. So maybe you remember that from 20 years ago, or whatever, you know. Yeah. A new refutation of the very possibility of Al Gore. Of, of Al Gore. <laughs> yeah. But I don't see how that could be because he invented the internet, and I know that the internet exists. So, you know. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> this would take us far afield, man. It's a very, it's a Heideggerian argument. Essentially. It's a Heideggerian argument. Yeah, yeah the nothing, nothings, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, anyway, so people, uh, we'll have a link to the Wall Street Journal piece in the in the uh, in the in the link section. People can go look at it. Um, and we will be talking about political philosophy today, so maybe we'll get to some of the issues. Um, but but uh, let's let's get back to uh, G. Moore. So. Um, on certainty. Yeah, and Wittgenstein. Okay, so so even though you, you cite Wittgenstein a lot as an influence in the book, you're pretty um, you pretty clearly don't accept too many of his uh, solutions or dissolutions of philosophical uh, problems. 
True. And I, I, the reason I kind of pushed you a little bit on more was that I thought that actually Wittgenstein was developing ideas that are in more rather than refute, rather than trying to argue against them. And so this was part of just sort of a personal little axe that I wanted to sort of right. or fight that I wanted to have out of you. But, why don't you. but since we're really talking about the book, I mean, we can, we can talk about our disagreement, but I really am more interested in what you think. Um, how, how does how does more figure into your the section on epistemology that we discussed at some length last time? Yeah, and specifically his uh, proof for the existence of the external world, his his answer to skepticism, right? Which is here is a hand and here is another, right? right? So you uh, just tell tell them the argument very quickly because yeah, people yeah. may not be familiar with it. Okay, yeah. so he, really he's addressing Kantian formulations. Um, whether we can prove that the external world exists or whether there are things to be found in space or whether there are things outside the mind. Uh, you know, he formulates it like that. And then he purports to prove that there are by waving his hands around, like here's a hand, here's another. Okay. Look at these things. These are outside my mind, aren't they? Right. You know? And then he says, well, you know, that's good enough. Like you believe it. I believe it what's Kant or Descartes saying? Like, I might not know that after all. Like, are you saying that I'm insane? Are you saying you yourself are insane? Uh, things like that. So it's, it's uh, you know, he called it in one paper along these lines, defense, a defense of common sense. Yeah. Uh, I think of it as, I mean, the move to me is the existence, our existence in a real world is, is a bottom line. Okay. I mean, and Wittgenstein does say that in a way too, you know, um, it's, you know, if we don't know that we don't know anything. And then furthermore, you know, then I have to deal with the, the ways that that idea that we, you know, there may, as for all we know, there is no external world by dealing with representational theories of mind. Kant is, you know, a beautiful example, really, uh, that hold that we know the external world by a series of images or sensations, sense data, you know, the empiricists are on this. And, you know, once you do that, then you're tempted to lop off the external world. But what if we sort of started the other way around and say like, okay, we know very well that we are creatures in a physical environment, right? right? Nothing could make that more, make us more certain of that, even the people who purport to doubt it. Okay. Right, right. Uh, and so let's start there. You know, and that's the way I read more. Not as like a here's a deductive refutation of skepticism, right. but just as pointing out again, you know, no one actually believes that. You don't right. believe it. like Sam Johnson kicking the stone, or there's another example I use. You right. bark, I refute it thus. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's it's a good enough refutation for me, given that I sincerely believe that. And I believe that we all believe it. Yeah. Uh, so so, so yeah. before I push you on this a little bit, let me just ask you in terms of the, the overall fit of these ideas into the section of epistemology, is your primary interest in more relative to the, relative to the, the book, the aims of the book, to deny, is this part of your, is this a specific instance of your rejection of the need for warrant? Um, yes. Because in the book, you know, we talked about this last time, one of the major elements of the epistemology is that as far as you're concerned, knowledge is simply true belief. Knowledge does not require <clears throat> warrant or justification. Right. We talked at some length about that and why you think that and about what you think the role of reasons are um, if, if they're not uh, defining of knowledge, then what are, then why do we want care if people have reasons or not? Yeah. Does this, so, so more is meant to fit into this. Yes. I mean, I have a couple passages more. I think this is not perfectly clear in more, but I think he is at least questioning the necessity of any sort of warrant or justification, uh, at least for certain kinds of knowledge. I was going to say not for all beliefs, no. but, but, for, but for what, for, I mean, is he simply say? Is he simply saying that these very fundamental beliefs, the, the sorts of beliefs that Descartes is going to say belong to epistemic foundations, is more simply going to say that these are simply things that, are, that have to be taken as givens? Yes, although I wouldn't, because Descartes' foundations are, uh, you know, sense data. All right, our representation. That's how right. it starts. That's right. how it's incorrigible and all right. that. I'd read more as saying, 
in the most ordinary cases, like where I say, you know, these are examples from more, you know, uh, I'm closer to the desk than to the window. Um, no, no justification is required and no justification is appropriate, except under very specific circumstances. You know, if you really think I'm insane or, you know, you think I'm in a CGI thing or over here or something like that, like there, you know, but in most of the ordinary things that we say and believe, we don't, we aren't required in order to know to, to produce a justification. In some cases, it's crazy to try to produce a justification uh, or it's inappropriate or even impossible to produce a justification. Yeah. I, I, basically, I'm attributing that idea to more. There's, yeah. there's suggestions in more on and off that, look, we're going to have to drop the justification condition for ordinary, you know, sense, sense uh, or empirical beliefs, I guess you'd say. Beliefs yeah. About yeah, yeah. No, that's very interesting. And, and the, the idea... Yeah, the idea that warrant is not always appropriately sought, I think, is sort of an interesting... Yes, um, and Wittgenstein has that on. I yeah, mean, one, yes, yes. One, one need not go as far as you go to even to accept the idea that warrant is not always appropriately, appropriately apl right. applied. Um, because one of the things that gonna, one of the things that Moore says, and I don't think it's in, I don't think it's in the proof of the external world. I think it's in the common sense paper. Moore says that there's certain things that we know with greater certainty than any of the reasons that could be given in a skeptical argument against Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. Um, like so, so, for example, you know, <laughs> there's an example from Austin. There's a pig. All right. Now, what do you want me to do? Produce a justification that goes like this? There seems to be a, a pink patch in the left -hand uh, upper right. left-hand <laughs> corner of my visual field. Okay. Now, is that more certain? Then that there's a pig right in front of us, not really because nothing could be more certain than that. Yeah, you know, and I, and the idea that justifications, particularly of the sort that move you inward into examining your own consciousness, I don't think you're going to get any more certain that way. And I don't think that we do justify ordinary right. empirical beliefs in that style. And right. I don't think we need to. Right, right. So, well, the, the, it's that last part that's sort of interesting, and this is why I sort of thought that Moore by himself was sort of inadequate. I think if all you're talking about what we, what we is what we do, Moore's absolutely right. You don't have to go farther. Right. But if you're talking about what we need to do, right, then you could easily say that Moore's inadequate. Um, you could say, look, you know, in a very obvious, and this is why probably most contemporary analytic philosophers would tell you that they think that the argument's terrible, and that is because it does not answer the argument from illusion or the dreaming argument. Now, sure. now, in, in other words, well, yes, it does in a way. Okay, well, so look, but it doesn't really. So, I mean, look, it, right, it, it so begs the, it begs here, the question. It begs the here, question is what it does. Here's a hand. Here's another. Right. Okay. It follows if from that the truth of that that there are things external to the mind. It right. follows. Right. Okay. So um, not if not if there's sense data, it doesn't. Right. Okay, and that's why I want to work on the whole idea of sense data, you know, right. like this. But you get to sense data heading. from the illusion arguments. You don't just yes. wake up one day and decide sure. to be a sense data theorist. That's true. You get to the sense data from the illusion arguments. And so normally yes. you would say, look, in this point in the dialectic, people have raised the illusion arguments. This led them down the road to, to uh, representational theories of the mind. Yes. Now, I'm very happy that you want to reject that. But if you want to reject that, you're going to have to come up with some other answer to the illusion arguments. You can't right. just act like nobody made them. And well, I, think I tried that, to, to some extent. Oh, not you. I'm talking about Moore. Yeah. I'm yeah. talking about yeah. Moore. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, no, but here's, here's why I think that this criticism of Moore is wrong, and that is Moore himself says in the essay that he doesn't answer the illusion argument, and he says you can't answer it. Right. So that tells me Moore is doing something a bit more subtle. Yes. He knows that this is not an adequate proof, right, in a certain sense, right? Yeah. Right. In that it doesn't answer the illusion arguments. Yes, um, that's true. And that's why I think Wittgenstein's uncertainty is a way to develop that point by showing why you don't need to, and right, and that's yeah. this whole point about hinge propositions and that the belief that there's a hand is basic relative to certain, you know, Anscombe has a notion of brute relative to other kinds of facts. And what counts as a brute fact is not definable in itself. It's always definable in relation to the thing Agreed. that it depends that depends on it, right? Right. And the practices right. 
that right. in which it arises. Right. And so I think the, 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 that that what uncertainty does is it sort of makes that clear, right? Um, that look, you know, the problem with saying there aren't any hands and doing using these illusion arguments is that there are hands is basic to all sorts of forms of life that you were engaged in, right? Yes. Um, and um, I agree with that. Yeah, and I think right. that that's right. Um, yeah. but, and I think that's really the only way to deal with the skeptic. I don't think you can refute the illusion right. arguments, I agree. honestly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you have to, well, I have a lot to say about that. But what, yeah, say, say, I, say something about right. it. Yeah, but sure. I, 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 let me say something about Wittgenstein, okay? Yeah, yeah. Dude drives me crazy, all right? I, you know, ever since I was in grad school, I was studying Wittgenstein with Cora Diamond. First of oh, all, well, she's, the, she's one of the best. Yeah, she's she's wonderful I mean, in many ways. So let me let, let me yeah, I let love me, her. Let me let yeah. me put yes, and I loved her in many ways as a teacher as well. Yeah, but yeah. She was kind of cult of Wittgenstein. Like the mm. basic question is not what's true, but what did Wittgenstein really mean? Or those are the same question. And but anyway, so I understand. There's, there's yeah, the yeah. Rebellion. But I also find Wittgenstein to be an obscurantist over and over. Really. Again. Yeah, or just to waffle. I mean, on certainty, I think I was rereading it and thinking, look, this this is very interesting in many respects. And, you know, it does extend in some ways rather than attack more, let's say, uh, et cetera. But I also say, like, he's it's a constant waffle, man. Like, do we know it? Do we know that here's a hand and here's another? You know, I don't know what Wittgenstein thinks about that from sentence to sentence, actually. And I think a philosopher ought to answer that question, you know? Mm. So, like, I'm actually going to read you one bit of this. This is uh, 288 of On Certainty. He says, I know, I know, not just that the earth existed long before my birth, but also that it is a large body and that this has been established that I and the rest of mankind have forebearers, that there are books about all this, and that such books don't lie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I know all this, question mark. Okay, the first sentence is, I know it. Then, and this is so typical of Wittgenstein. Yeah. I know it, question mark. I believe it. This body of knowledge has been handed on to me, and I have no grounds for doubting it. But on the contrary, all sorts of confirmations. And why shouldn't I say that I know all this? Isn't that what it, one does say? All right. All right. But not only I know or believe all that, but others do too. All right. So, et cetera. Like, okay. He just didn't answer the question. He of course that not. He, he mostly asks questions, questions and he only answers them about 30% of the time. And half of them are not the right answers. Right? Well, okay. He, right. <laughs> That's I mean, the he, method. That's how he does things. I mean, he asserted that he knows it and he asserted <laughs> that he doesn't know it. Yeah. Or did he assert anything? Or did he just ask a series of rhetorical questions? Or were they serious questions? I don't know. All right. Um, yeah. And, you know, and the thing is, the, the way I read Wittgenstein in uncertainty is that he's putting incredibly severe conditions on knowledge. He thinks knowledge requires absolute indubitable proof. All right. Now, that to me is just like a hangover from the positions that he should be profoundly rejecting. Right, it's just a, it's just Plato again from the Theaetetus. Yeah, do you really think? Why, I mean, why not leave us with knowledge as a, something that we can use? You know, a, a term that we can apply to things that we know very well. Uh, or why not respect our use of the term "no" a little more than he does? He makes it impossible to know anything ultimately. I mean, I, I think, but just by imposing these excru excruciating justification conditions on knowledge holding that they are part of our ordinary conception of knowledge. And I don't think they are. And I think that's what Moore shows, actually. Um, that's but, interesting that, that, you, that you find him as having a sort of a very severe uh, 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 constraint um, on, on knowledge, because if anything, the passage you read me show, tells me that Wittgenstein, one of, the things he's, one of the things he's pointing out is that we mean a lot of different things by knowledge. And there certainly is a common ordinary use of the word knowledge in which it does mean something like your, you know, the things you know are much stronger than the things you believe, right? I mean, I mean, there is, there is an ordinary use in which, in which knowledge is taken even to require some, 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 some answer to the skeptical, to the, to at least skeptical considerations. No, that's not an ordinary use of the term. Well, not the, not the philosophical skeptical ones, but I mean like ordinary skeptical ones. So like, I mean, a lot of people when they, when they'll sort of, sort of push you on, well, does he really know that? Right. right. Um, right. What, what they mean. 
I think usually they're asking, is it really true? Right? I don't think if you were assured of the truth of P and someone said they knew that P, that you say, would, do they really know that? What you want to know is whether it's true, in, at least in some situations like this. And that would be to us, that is relevant to whether the person knows or not. Because if it's not true, then they don't know it after all, right? You're trying to see whether the, yeah. con the actual conditions on knowledge are met. That is whether the target proposition is true. Right. But you see, this, this brings us, this actually does bring us right back to the sort of one of the, the central thesis of this part of the book. And that is that, you know, in my view, talk of knowledge is in part talk about the epistemic condition of the knower. In other words, ascription. In other words, in other words, um, I agree with you that sometimes when somebody asks, you know, does he really know that? He's asking, is it really true? But I also would say that sometimes when somebody asks, well, does he really know that? They're asking about the position of the knower, right? Yeah, that, that is true sometimes, yes. Um, um, and, so, and so I'm at least hesitant. I love the fact that you destroy everything. Sometimes I just, I just don't, I wish you'd destroy it this other way, right? Um, <laughs> um, you know, in other words, I, don't, I think I'm a little reluctant to give up the idea that, that epistemic notions are partly about the condition of the knower, right? Yeah. And that, that, that certain uh, 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 pro pro predicates that we use to describe, uh, epistemic predicates that we use, are types of honorifics that describe the position of the knower. Um, yes. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's something you need to worry about and that we do worry about in, in these kind of questions is, is this person a reliable source of information? Or is there something... How know, does he know that could be asking that, right? Is he a reliable uh, 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 source of information, right? What are his Why, sources? Where does he get this from, right? I yeah, mean, but usually it's going to be a controversial claim that, that, it, that how does he know that is bearing on is it true or not, right? Which is a conceptual condition on knowledge in my view, right? That, right but what's the relationship between is it true or not on the one hand, and on the other hand, is he in a position to know whether it's true or not? Well, because... For one thing, we have to. He got it all third hand. He never. He didn't see it himself. He didn't. Da, da, da. All the things that we might say in response to, does he really know that? I might say things that point to it's the truth or falsity of it, but I also may say things, say things like, "Well, he wasn't there. How would he know that?" Right. Right. He heard that from some third party. Right. Right. But <laughs> wouldn't you also be in that case normally doubting that what he says is true? I mean, if you. Agree, yeah. Oh yes. 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 I mean. And also, another thing I'd say is, if this is the case in some situations, that is to know, you know, we, to, be, to assess someone as knowing, we have to know something about their process and their access and so on. Um, and in other cases not, shouldn't we immediately conclude that justification or warrant is not necessary condition for knowledge? I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, you know, it's important in some situations. In some situations, it's not relevant. Yeah. That's enough to establish my thesis that yeah. justification is not required for knowledge. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, look, I think the whole process, the whole project of trying to actually define knowledge in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions is a mistake. Anyway, I mean, okay, as, fair enough. as yeah. someone who's a fan yeah. of the later Wittgenstein myself to quite a great degree, that's something I would never be on board with anyway. Um, um, yeah, but I am just interested. Look, I mean, that's, I'm not trying to hang you on a technicality. Um, I'm just more interested right, in, okay, how little, how little, interest do you have in warrant in the epistemic subject area right i mean how unimportant do you think it is that's why i last that's why last time i pressed you on yeah well when is it important that people have good reasons right well especially right. when we we doubt what they're saying yeah you know or we're trying to figure out the truth of the matter where there's controversy it. yes then you know what you know then whatever procedures do lead to truth we want to know whether those kind of procedures have been followed. And that's a way we're assessing, you know, whether what, whether the person, what the person believes is true, uh, whether we should agree with them. And then also more widely, whether they're kind of a reliable epistemic agent, like whether they normally have good reasons, because if they don't, then a lot of what they say will turn out to be false. Yeah.
Yeah. I mean, or if that's not true, then we should, you know, justification has to be truth conducive. It has to be, uh, yeah. you know, you give reasons to believe the proposition to be true. You know, that, that's what a, a decent, any decent justification has to constitute that much. Yeah. yeah. You know, anyway. Let me ask you one last thing about this, because this occurred to me as you were just talking. Um, you say, look, you know, reasons, reasons should not be taken as definitive of knowing. Where reasons really matter is where we have controversy over what's true, and then we bring our reasons to bear. Um, uh, we try to, you know, give our reasons in such a way so, so as to persuade others uh, of that this is the truth or that's the truth. Um, but I guess I almost wonder whether that somewhat sits uncomfortably with the picture of knowledge that you've painted more generally, and that is, look, I thought that knowledge wasn't inferential. I thought that knowledge yeah. was direct. I thought yeah. that knowledge was... So why are these controversies? And right. then, and then <laughs> why, when there are these controversies, would it suddenly become relevant to give reasons from which the, con the truth can be inferred, right? Or otherwise... <laughs> In, in well, other words, aren't you conceding a bit to the inferentialist model? Yes. By giving any any room to reasons. Oh, now, yeah. now I think well, you have to because otherwise it's ridiculous to say reasons yeah. never matter, right? That's right. Yeah. So yeah. how do you? Right. It, that's true, and I I'm not sure I got this you know all in the same uh, boat adequately because my really where, I, where I'm going is that most of what we know we you know not only are we not representational systems we're not primarily reasoning or inferential systems either. And Wittgenstein is really on this. Like, I love this. Yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. like it, this has to do with our practices, our experiences in the world. And, you know, and, you know, so squirrels know plenty of stuff or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, and we're yeah. like that. And like our inferences and our propositional beliefs are parasitic on that, you know, mm. a much wider realm of truth and knowledge in which we're operating and to and to privilege the inferential or the sentential, the propositional yeah. moves, um, it's too cognitivist. It, seems. it almost sounds like Ryle a little bit. Yeah, that knowing yes. that is a form of knowing how, and thus knowing yes. how can't be reduced to propositional knowledge. Yes, um, yes that's right. And I guess the sense in which a squirrel knows something is that it knows how. It's, it doesn't know that's that. Part of it. it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't represent concepts, right? Well, it might know that that's a nut in some way uh but this is going to take us very yeah far. no 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 i don't, I don't want to go yeah. down that yeah, yeah yeah. even though the proposition doesn't we'll do another dialogue through. on that one yeah okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um um i'm already thinking of like 10 dialogues i want to do with you yeah, okay um, good, <laughs> um this is fun <laughs> it's also good for you it's, it's <laughs> i do I, it's it's like taking your medicine it's like taking your vitamins it's good for you <laughs> all right um so part two is on values and I'm doing this because I'm looking at the book. So, mm -hmm. um, and you break this down, ethics, aesthetics, political philosophy. We're going to do ethics and political philosophy. Dr. Sartwell, who is an expert in ethics, has already agreed to do a dialogue with me solely on aesthetics at some later date. Right. Um, I'm, more, I'm more of an expert on aesthetics. I think you said ethics, but yeah. I'm sorry, aesthetics. I struggled um, into ethics in this book um, a little bit. I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you know that um, 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 the audience has been clamoring for a dialogue on aesthetics. I tried to get Noel Carroll to do it, but he was too important for me, and so uh, I had difficulty. With, I had. Diff I'll be too important for you. Man. I was. I was unim too unimportant for him. I think. Um, um, so I had difficulty. Uh, I had difficulty getting him to do it. Um, he said he would, and then he kind of disappeared, and I wasn't able uh, to. Oh, um, Anyway, um, so you're my other, we're, we're my other person I thought of, and now that we've done this, I, I th so we're going to leave aesthetics out this time, uh, so audience, please don't get angry at me, we're going to do a whole dialogue on that some other time. So we're going to talk about the ethics and the political philosophy. Um, I just want to start off, first of all, the introdu I, <laughs> your introductions are as good as the book. Um, no, no, seriously, they, they, usually introductions are kind of throwaway. Your introductions are really amazing. I mean, they, oh, I, I think I got as many questions out of the introductions to the two sections as I do. So, right, because a lot of times in an academic book, introduction is just a summary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's really unnecessary, actually. I yeah. Mean, 
or it might help a little bit, you know, if you need a preview or whatever. But it yeah. almost like the introduction is taking the place of what used to be the analytical table of contents yeah. that you would see in analytical philosophy. But yeah. Yours, yours are not, and so, um, so this, 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 there's something in the introduction to part two that gets at the very general question of what values are. Yes. Um, which then is going to be applied throughout, um, um, uh, whether it's a, uh, ethical, aesthetic, or political. And it's this, this, this way in which you get around the subjective-objective dispute on values. And you describe what you call four moments um, uh, or aspects of the act of asserting that something that is beautiful, good, or just. So could you talk a little bit about, first of all, what is the problem between subjective and objective with respect to value? And how is it that you're getting around all that problem by the way of this sort of four moments? Because I thought that was really well stated and interesting. Right. And so hmm. what's the all problem right. and how yeah. are you not falling into the problem? Okay. Yeah, I think that, you know, Western axiology or value theory has really gotten caught on in this dilemma. You know, it, are values things in the world or are they things in consciousness? Um, and, it, you know, I call that like a crushing dilemma. Like, and I don't want to take either of those, you know, views plainly because I think they both lead you to really crazily implausible theories in a certain way. But I mean, really, the whole of Western philosophy since, you know, since the 18th century has tended to move subjective on these. I mean, there, there, there are other moves. And it depends on what you mean by subjective, but in, inside the consciousness right. type of views. And then the problem yeah. has been to say, well, how can they be normative if they're, right. if they're subjective? And then you've got the great projects of Hume and Kant. Yes, exactly. To try and show how the subjective can also be right. normative. Right, right, right because right. They're, Hume and Kant are caught in the human subject. In, they're, they're, there seems to be no escape. Like you can only do this from within the human subject because that's the only possible, that's the only reality you know. Right. And that carries um, over to the 20th century. I mean, J.L. Mackey says that to say that there are values in the world is to, is to commit to a queer metaphysics, right? Yes, um, or, right. Or yeah. that's one reason that it'll drive you to hedonist, uh, hedonist utilitarianism and stuff like this. Like it has to come down to subjective states. So it has to be somebody's pleasures. And then you try to add them all up. Right, um, right, you know, right. I, I just don't think that that's a plausible way to go. And, and really the example for me, and you know, I have done this over decades really, is beauty. If any value is subjective in the tradition, it's beauty. It would be beauty, right, yeah. right. And, and beauty has been demoted off of the philosophical pedestal as a great human value precisely because people couldn't figure out how to make it not just a matter of me having pleasures you have different pleasures. You think that's beautiful. I think that's beautiful. What the hell? We're not even disagreeing about anything. Not no matter of fact. We're just describing our own emotional states or whatever. Right. Right. Um, you know that's how the positivists got rid of ethics, aesthetics, and everything else. Yeah. Um, or you know religious uh, religious claims and any you know. But so one thing I, I just say like just to start is when I say of like a sunset, let's say or rose that it's beautiful, I am not describing my own internal states. I, you know, just on the face of it, the form of the grammar is that I'm attributing a property to this external object, all right? right. Um, and to, I'm not saying, it's not equivalent to saying that the sunset is beautiful, that I am having a certain kind of pleasure, for example. I could see that the sunset was beautiful even if I wasn't having such a pleasure, right? Like, say I'm just like so, you know. Right, one I, can I, disinterestedly recognize beauty. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. But, and, and so I think it's just a sad, I sad betrayal right. of the experience of beauty to say it's about my subjective states. And yeah. this will pull you into like a kind of crazy solipsism as well. Yeah. So, and I think once you have an external world and once you have real sunsets outside of my consciousness, and I don't see why you shouldn't, um, we do. Right. Then why not? So, okay. So, but then why not, then why not go back to the objective side? In other words, right. I, I, I'm interested also in knowing why you don't accept that. Right. You don't accept this dichotomy at all. Right. That's what your four moments is an yeah. effort to sort of say, no, there aren't just two. 
it's either out there or in here, right? Right. So what's yeah. wrong with you? Just said what's wrong with the it's in here. Yes. What's wrong with the it's out there? The Platonic, let's say, tradition of that values are objective, right? Yes. Um, well, what, what's wrong with that? <laughs> that does lead, lead you to a queer metaphysics, I guess. You know, and and I think that. I, I don't want to, by the same token, disengage the experience of beauty from anyone's experience or response to it. Like if there were no beings who were capable of experiencing beauty, it's not senseless to say that there wouldn't that be there's any. no beauty in that, in that universe. So, I mean. So you so, want to say that there is a, that there is an ineliminable role of perceivers, right? Yes, in, in, in values particularly. But it not should like, not be thought that right. they are simply properties of perceivers. Right, exactly. They're properties of situations. Okay, and so now I, talk I, about that and that'll get yeah. us the four. And yeah. this cut, and Moore is so great on this again. In, in this I know, there's a quote yeah. in here. So yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and you know, what he says is, the question about whether something is beautiful is not the question of whether I'm having a little ex orgasm in my head or something. Uh, it's, it's, it's a question about whether the whole situation embedding me and the object um, and the environing conditions uh, has a certain kind, itself has a certain kind of value. So once you don't think that only, what, if you don't think that consciousness is uh, all we have, and you don't think that consciousness isn't anything, then there's no reason not to avail yourself of a situation overall. So these four moments, I would say, like in value theory are, or in construction of values, or the reality of values, or what values are, is, let me see if I can remember these four moments. Okay, so. Well, I've got it open here. You want me to read them? <laughs> I think I should them? get it. The subjective response of the perceiver, the, right. the object in question, Okay, or the situation in question, like the ethical situation in question, let's say. The environing conditions, like for example, you know, the light coming from the sunset into my eyes or the, you know, there's a million environing uh, uh, conditions that make it possible to have any kind of ethical dilemmas or whatever. And then sp one specific to each situation. And then finally, a set of linguistic practices or, you know, a set of structures for understanding fitting these experiences into categories and so right. on, a vocabulary, a social aspect. So I'd call these like the, you know, the, the subjective or the individual, the objective or the, the actual situation, the environmental and the social. And I think that values are things specifically that are made up of all four of those in every case. Like that's, I think that's right. all aesthetic values ethical values, political values, and so on. Right. Having now, I, I, it's, you know, it's really very clear in the example of the beauty and the object, um, the sunset, let's say. Could you maybe, for the sake of clarity, so that it's not so abstract, talk me through the same four pieces with respect to some sort of uh, uh, ethical value? So, so yeah. because I've always thought of value as the idea that something matters. Right. Um, and, okay. and so and so it's got to matter to someone. Things can't just matter sure. independently of, of people. Yes, that's true. Um, right. And so, you know, part of the reason why it's, you know, why utilitarianism is so appealing is that, uh, you know, happiness really is something that seems to matter to pretty much everyone. Right. Um, well, so I'm a maybe, skeptic about about the happiness. So but but yeah. let's let's just pretend or that okay let's then let's maybe not have it. How about just pleasure, okay? All right. Um um pleasure is certainly valuable. I mean that doesn't mean it's always valuable, but it's certainly valuable, you know, sometimes think about how many things we do for the sake of it, right? Um um that are perfectly legitimate. I mean, isn't that part of the reason you go to the art museum is to enjoy yourself? Isn't that part of the reason you go to the movies? Isn't that part of the reason that you Fuck I somebody. Just, I mean, I don't know. I mean, hey, hey, maybe I I'm a wanna, weird guy, but I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I just <laughs> want to say that I think that the, the terms pleasure and happiness are useless, man. They're all utterly general. They're so blank. I mean, the pleasure of going to an art museum and the pleasure of having sex, let's say, or the pleasure of eating a good meal, 
and the pleasure those of, are the three of my favorite things yeah yeah exactly right there. Yeah, I, those are the ones that occur to me right uh uh you know these are not similar experiences in many ways and it it it, it it's i don't think folding them all up into one category really helped and i also think like for example saying that all people are seeking happiness i think that's some kind of trivial or conceptual truth or something because so happiness you, is, is it, happiness is just a stipulated blank. So do you it's simply want to say that we really only value particulars? Is that really what you're getting at here? No. Or at least I part think, of what you're getting at here? Well, I, I think this, the psychology has to be made more complex. I, I don't think that folding up every experience we seek and calling it pleasure is helping us understand the actual structure of human motivations. And I also think human beings often seek pains or seek many, many things that are neither pleasures nor pains. And I just think like we've made a hash out of human motivation by trying to reduce it to a single dimension or something like that. Um, but yeah, okay, so do you want me to run it through like an ethical situation of some kind? Like yeah, that? well, given my, my failed attempt here, to, so, so, so do yeah. it yourself. I mean, <laughs> show me how... Well, the reason I asked you about the thing about the particulars was now I'm starting to wonder whether, you know, yeah, okay, I could see those four, those four modes if you're talking about valuing a particular. Then I could see right. how the four modes come into play. And so that, that's why I said that. But, yes, go ahead and, and talk hmm. me through the same thing you just did with the beauty of the sunset. Okay. With some, something that I value in the ethical sense. Right. All right. I don't know. Uh, you want to take the Russian scandal, the Trump Russia scandal, or something? <laughs> Donald Trump. I guess Trump would have to come Donald up at Trump. some point since everybody is having a collective I, I meltdown over it. Or, <laughs> so or how about? I mean, how about mountaintop removal or something like that? Or, sure. Why not? Uh, yeah. yeah. Or okay. Um, global warming. <laughs> okay. Global climate change. Make uh, India stop industrializing, right? It's just right. <laughs> Right. Okay. So what makes global climate change an ethical problem? Let's say it's an, a, 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 a bad situation ethically or something like that. Well, uh, first of all, this has to do with the actual emission of carbons into the atmosphere. There's an objective set of facts about this. And right. this, scientists have struggled to establish this, right? And they have established it, really. Um, so, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, you know, carbon in the atmosphere and a certain amount of heating. And this actually does not depend on anyone's opinion about those things or any, whether anyone takes pleasure or pain in them, for example, right. not exactly. Right. Like, I mean, you could have a pleasure of being in a sunbathing in the, in a climate changed environment or something like that, that wouldn't make it a good thing. Um, all right. So then, okay. And then, there are the subjective, let's say, aspects of value, like the way you respond to an environment, or even like your political views. Your these are not merely subjective. I'm trying to think of the subjective aspects. So, like, like, well, you're talking, you're talking about like, like people's experiences of the various yeah. effects of the climate change. So, yeah. you know, let's say, let's say it causes some some area to 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 to, to suffer tremendous flooding. Yes. So this will cause people to lose their homes. It yes. may cause them to have to relocate. It may that right. causes pain and suffering and right. misery exactly. and all that. So that's right. the subjective aspect. Of right. It. So the su yeah. let's say suffering. Yeah. Yeah, is yeah. again. I have little problems with as a big category, but, but you're yeah. gonna have to just get yes. over it because yes. otherwise, yes. We're okay. <laughs> I'll never get through. Uh, yeah, um, right. Okay, Suff people suffering. That's relevant. Right. Or suffering even of other creatures. Right. Right. Um, and but then, you know, we're not gonna be able to specify this value or articulate it, and why this is a problem without fitting it into our existing ethical categories or, you know. Do you mean uh, in terms of why the suffering is morally relevant? Well, that's one thing, but not only that, but why, say, destruction of the environment, what that means. And, mm. and you know, that has to do with, in part, with our vocabularies for understanding these things, which shift over time, right? Like, we understand it differently than they might have 500 years ago, changes in the environment. You know, we have a kind of naturalistic conception. We have categories we fit this into, ways of making the arguments, uh, ways of fitting it into a whole set of values that, you know, 
we may share or some of us may share and some may not. And, you know, struggling through conversations and the social aspect, defining the terms, you know, uh, arguing about what term is appropriate. Is it climate change, global warming, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, there's a social aspect to it for sure in establishing whether this is a bad thing. Um, now, you know, this is such a global environmental Distinguishing the objective from the environmental in my sense in this case would be it's not necessary because it's just a, it's, it's about the macro environment, right, right, again, right, right. you know, but, you know, if you were taking like a case where of a murder or something like that, you know, um, then you have to say, well, there's all these circumstances that make make the murder possible and right. then you know, make it possible for us to find out about it and all that kind of stuff as well. But I guess what I, w- I would want to know then is, is look, it seems to me hard to suggest that someone like Jeremy Bentham or John Stuart Mill didn't know that there were all these dimensions of an ethical situation, yes. right? But yes. it's it, that, 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 that it, to them, what was, re- what was morally relevant in, of all those variables was the experience of the people to those objective circumstances within a certain frame of reference and of right. certain using a certain language. In other words, why do you want to resist their attempt to isolate the morally relevant feature out of those other features? In other words, what is it what is it about their effort to isolate morally relevant features that you want to that you're resisting? Why? Well, I think that all these things are morally relevant features. The objective facts of the matter are, and, and the subjective states are no more morally relevant than objective facts. But don't, right? we like, care, I, don't, we care, don't we care about someone's suffering even if there is no good reason for it? In other words, even, I mean, in other, in other words, I don't know that I'm not morally concerned even if somebody's misery is ill-founded, Right. That, well, look, you know, look, look, that the reality doesn't correspond to it. You know what I mean? Right. Are, are you more, are you just as concerned with the suffering of the privileged as with the suffering of the oppressed, for example? So depends, like someone's like sipping their latte and they're, and they're telling you, you know, like, Oh man, I fucking hate life, man. Like my Lexus, like I got a flat tire and shit, you know, and like, and plus, you know, my childhood, like I really suffer. Like I, my, my, relation with my mom is so fraught and stuff like that. And then, you know, maybe they have a degree of subjective suffering that's equal to someone who's, you know, let's just stipulate yeah. starving to death or imprisoned or something yeah. like that. They're portraying it that yeah. way. No, this is really interesting. Actually, I, I didn't think we were going to get on this, but this is really interesting and important. I mean, I'm presuming you're asking me this because you, you wouldn't. No, not necessarily anyway. I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't reduce the moral situation to any particular suffering or lack thereof. I mean, it's, it's not that these things are irrelevant to the moral quality of a situation. They're there in the, in the fourfold, you know, ontology of the value. They're important. They have to be taken into consideration, but they're not dispositive and they're not all we're worried about. Like I'm worried about stuff that is not anybody's subjective state. You know, right, um, but aren't you worried about it from a moral point of view because of its effect on people's? In other words, let's let, let's yeah. do the thought experiment backwards. Okay, let's suppose that the effects of global warming didn't cause anybody any misery. So let's say you know, fine, right. okay, now now New York's underwater, yeah. and so everybody said, great, we'll turn it into Atlantis, right? And I don't mind having to move my house, and I don't mind, you know. You know, I don't mind the fact that, you know, these animals aren't going to be here anymore. And these are, in other words, let's just stipulate that everybody reacted to the effects of global warming with equanimity. I mean, would it then be a moral problem? I think, well, I think moral problems still might arise. I think, like, for example, wiping out animal species or something like that, like that has moral content, even Even if if nobody cares. Even Even if if nobody cares. Yeah. Yeah, basically, yes. I mean, I think they probably care in some sense, you know, whether they live or die and that's relevant, but it doesn't come down to their subjective states either. We have to think about our actual physical relation to our environment and so on, as well as, uh, you know, our subjective responses in that relation or whatever. Uh, I just think that 
look, subjective states are, and suffering and pleasure are relevant, but they're not the only thing that's relevant. Right. Well, no, I mean, I would agree. I mean, yeah. something like flourishing, let's say in the Aristotelian sense, you could also argue is morally relevant. Right. What, I'm pushing, yeah. what I'm pushing you a little bit on is whether purely physical states of affairs in themselves under purely physical descriptions have any moral valence. And it almost sounds to me like you have to say something like that there is objective morality in the old fashioned sense, because otherwise it becomes somewhat mysterious. Why well, does this matter if it doesn't matter to anyone, right? I'm, right. Well, I'm saying the subjective states are relevant. And I'm saying if there are no subjective states in play, it, or if there are no subjects in play, because I have problems with subjective states, I guess. But uh, Okay, I'm, then, I'm, I'm then, good with that. Then there's no, then there's no values. It, there, it may be that there's no sense in talking about value in that So case. subjects are ineliminable, but they're not yeah. sufficient in your view. Correct. And, and most ethics take them as being sufficient, as being both necessary and sufficient, you think? I think, and also, or at a minimum, emphasize them relentlessly too okay. much. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't want, and I don't want us to battle these things for, my point is not to interrogate your book, but to get you to bring out the really interesting <laughs> Hey, I'm, re I'm ready to battle too much. I know you are. I'm not saying this because around. I think you're afraid of me, because I know you're not. <laughs> it's more just a matter of, um, you know, what this is supposed to be, which sure. is an exploration of your book. Um, let me ask you, because this is another uh, subject dear to my heart, um, that I think I sent you a link to something I wrote about. You, you give a lot of prominence in the ethics chapter. I mean, before you even get to a discussion of any moral philosophy, you have a pretty big discussion of free, the free will problem. Yes. So first of all, why don't you say something about why why you why you did it this way in other words right i could read 10 books on ethics and they don't talk about the free will problem at all why did you feel okay before i talk about ethics at all i gotta talk about i gotta get this out of the right. way and secondly maybe talk a little bit about your determinism which i reject but 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 maybe you could tell me about uh, tell everyone sure. about your determinism and how you think it affects your moral your moral your view on moral philosophy sure uh all right so one th reason I took on the free will problem first, I mean, it's a question whether it should be in the ethics chapter or the metaphysics chapter or something like that. It definitely bears on all these different, comes out of these different questions. Do you think you questions. can't do ethics until you go through that problem first? Is that why you put it in the place well, you put it? Well, I think that moral responsibility is a central question in ethics. Mm -hmm. And that it's, you know, and that the free will problem has been a crisis in that. Like it's something that you probably have to try to dispose of in some way before you get, I mean, you could wave it off and, you know, or write a promissory note for it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's pretty fundamental to, and then how you think about human free will is pretty fundamental to, you know, what could possibly be good and evil or, you know, for what you, one could be responsible and who is responsible for what and so right, on. Right, right. Uh, so, I mean, whether it's part of ethics exactly, you know, not necessarily exactly or not right. all of it. But it's probably uh, because you are doing a system. If, if you had just written a paper on ethics, you probably wouldn't start every one with a sure. discussion of the free will. But That's because right. it's a systematic book. Yeah. Okay. Right. And also, I think like specific people that I attack and specific traditions I attack in here, um, it's the free will problem and the, and, the, and the ways of addressing that it are very bound up with the ethical system. So Christine Korsgaard, for instance, these kind of neo-Kantian yeah, yeah. uh, style views. And then relating that to John Martin Fisher on the free will problem, they centralize rationality. They make rationality the key or reason, the key to human free will, the possibility of human free will. Self-consciousness is maybe the ground of freedom, freedom the ground of moral responsibility you know, and so moral content. And I'm concerned to, I guess, attack that whole tradition in a, in a way. Yeah. Like, it's, it's so in revival now. Yeah. I don't yeah. think of myself as a rational subject in the course guard, course guard or Fisher sense or the Kantian sense or whatever. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, sometimes I'm rational, sort of. Sometimes I'm not. It's hard to know. But that's not basically what I am. And right. if we're doing ethics for human beings, we're going to have to get off that cognitivist, uh, professorial, yeah. I'm sitting here running through arguments style of account of human action in general. I mean, maybe it goes back to Aristotle's practical syllogism and things like that. It's a very ancient type of view. 
And I don't privilege rationality and I don't privilege self-consciousness in the same way that a lot of figures do on this. I, I want to resist, though, blaming Aristotle for this, only because of all people, Aristotle would not have isolated ration, reason. I agree. I agree. Radiocination from all the other. I agree. Uh, uh, yeah. These figures take like Aristotelian deliberation or practical syllogisms as pretty key yeah. for describing. Yeah, and then the, but they extract yeah. it from all yes. the from all the all I the rest agree. of it. Which, yeah. I completely agree. Um, um, from um, its social context in yeah. Aristotle and you know political yeah. context among other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah. you in terms of your negative thesis, I'm with you all the way. I, I mean, I think that the the way in which agency has been understood and the uh, that goes back to the kind of is pretty is pretty screwed up. I mean, um, it's and, pretty, unre- it's and pretty, unredeemable. Yeah. It's unredeemable, yeah, right? I, and, I it's, agree. and it's depressing it's that it's resurgent, right? I mean, I it, it just shows how stagnant. And uh, I mean, our, our 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 discipline reminds me of Hollywood, right? I mean, it's just sort of like <laughs> we yeah. just can't fucking That's produce. Good. No, and I almost wonder whether it's just because we're no longer producing great great minds anymore because of the way the system works. I mean, I think I, you and I, I could have. Yeah, you can and I can have a whole other discussion about the, dis- <laughs> yeah. about the discipline. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and, um, and um, you know, new work is not rewarded, you know, I would say, or new... No, ideas. it's not possible. No, I agree. You can't do real speculative work and get into any journal. You cannot. It, right, or, you, or, or get a job. No. You know, after a while. No, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, you, could, you could only write something like this well into a career you could not <laughs> yeah. do this at the beginning right I and the mean, career has been a hell of a struggle for that reason among others i yeah, think yeah but yeah, um yeah, all right yeah. I, so the basic argument i, I just want to say is that free will is not required for moral responsibility i think we can be responsible i want to hold on to a, a concept of moral responsibility whether or not we have free will in any sense okay so or, you are are you would you yeah. call yourself then a, con- a compatibilist uh, cause it's what it sounds like. Okay. I, that description I you just gave, right, I don't <laughs> think that determinism is necessarily compatible with free will. Okay. I, or freedom. Ah, I, I see. Yeah. Okay. So I think that we are not, well, I'm speculating that we are not free except in, I, I, I really try to work this out. Like in, in certain ways, perhaps we are, but even if we are not free in any sense, and even if determinism is not compatible with freedom, it is compatible with responsibility. So actually, this is one of the possible positions in the taxonomy. I, um, Fisher calls it semi-compatibilism. Yeah. I don't know a whole bunch of people that have taken this position, though, but it's certainly one of the possibilities, you know, in the, if you're matching, mix and matching in the grid of possible positions. Um, you know, so it's a difficult position to argue, I suppose. Um, but I think it's actually pretty common sense in a way, too. Like right. one, one example I give is 12-step programs, which, um, you know, so AA, I think, is, is pretty much the source of the disease model of addiction. So, and they're very clear that you have no control if you're an addict, if you're an alcoholic. Right. You, can't stop you are powerless over alcohol right they teach you that and then they teach you that to get better you're going to have to take responsibility for all the shit you did when you were drinking okay (laughs) even though you weren't free to do it and you're gonna have to do it in detail you're gonna have to reflect on what you did and try to make amends to each person you harmed and so on so they say both that you did not do act freely and that you are responsible. Yeah, but is that philosophically defensible? I mean, it's certainly, you could say it, um, right. um, um, but does that make any kind of sense? Well, I think it does. I, How? I like, How? Well, why not? I mean, let's say like, I think a lot of our practices involve taking responsibility or, attributing responsibility in cases where the person is not clear or oneself is, is not clearly free uh, in now what the hell freedom means or what the different senses of freedom. We have to work on that obviously for hours or whatever. But um, I think our, a lot of our ordinary discourse around this does attributes responsibility without regard 
to freedom, much less without regard to establishing how freedom is possible in a deterministic universe or something. Well, I, I guess, I guess, look, let's talk, let's stick with the AA case. Um, I guess I would, I would want to push them a little bit. I'd say, well, what, 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 what do you mean when you say I have no control, right? I mean, in, right. in, other, in other words, I guess that what I would want to say is that if you really mean this other stuff you're saying, then you really don't mean that I had no control, right? Because, because look, I'll give you an, let me give you an example where you really have no control, okay? Yeah. Suppose I hypnotize you and send you off to rob a bank. Yes. Right? Now, you'd be absolutely crazy to suggest that this person is respond that you were responsible for robbing the bank. Right. Yes. And the obvious reason you weren't is because in a very relevant sense, you didn't rob the bank. I did. Right. Right. Um, True. um despite the fact that your body was involved in, in robbing the bank. And so True. the obvious explanation is, well, you, yes, your body was, but you had no control over it. Right. Now I'm presuming that the AA folks are not suggesting that you don't have control in that sense. And so uh, I'm not sure I think it's really a very good example of somebody who is responsible despite lacking agency, right? Right. Uh, although, I mean, I think the addiction shows up as a, a problem in all, almost all historical discussions of free will. Uh, it certainly reduces agency at a minimum, all right? Uh, and I do, and I have had this experience of actually deliberating and, and, and deciding not to drink, I'm a recovering alcoholic, um, and drinking anyway. Like, like, no, 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 glug, glug, glug. I mean, it comes pretty close to uh, really being seized from your hands. And I think that this might be more typical of human action than we think it is. Um, but isn't, it, that, isn't that really a matter of, let me ask you, I mean, isn't that... Look, we've, I've gone through this. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to claim being an alcoholic and, or anything else of that sort. But, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I, 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 you know, I've sort of entertained the question of whether I wanted yeah. or didn't want to do something. Yeah. I mean, isn't that, doesn't that just simply go to the fact we that the will or you really haven't decided yet, right? <sighs> well, I think you're reconstructing. Because how many people quit cold turkey? I well, mean, the majority yeah. of people who quit, quit cold turkey, everything. That includes smoking, right? So isn't this really just a matter of when you've actually really decided? And you just haven't yet, right? right? I mean. No, but I think when you quit cold turkey, that's usually not when you've decided either. It's usually you've been driven to uh, despair, you know, mm. or like you're, you're forced absolutely into a corner in some way. Usually that's when people start recovery. I mean, it's from different things, mm, uh, differently, mm. you know. So you uh, actually don't think it's usually a decision? No. I mean, I, I think a decision, decision is in there somewhere, you know. Um, I think it's desperation usually. I, I don't think we do most of what we do by deliberating and deciding, actually. I think that that's to some extent, an a illusory overlay on the actual, I mean, this is typical of determinists, right? Like Spinoza or something like, it's our ignorance of the actual causes of our action, or it's our excessive self-esteem that makes us think like we are the agents of our own actions in some very strong sense. Like it emerges gotcha. straight from my own deliberation. I'm suspended between this one and this one. You know, I consider reasons. I move toward that one or whatever. Like I, don't experience myself that way very often, at least, you know. Uh, and I don't think that is, in general, a very good explanation for most human action. Okay. You know? So, okay. like, I mean, one, one example I use that I, I'm kind of proud of this part of the book is imp jazz improv. Yeah, jazz yeah, improv. yeah, yeah, yeah. Louis Armstrong. Okay. Like, that's, it's a, if I was thinking of a free human action, a jazz, a great jazz improvisation would be about as good as I could do. That's a, that's as free as human beings get. But first of all, of course, you don't get Louis Armstrong able to do that with all, without all these external conditions. Right. And second of all, if Louis Armstrong, while he plays the cadenza to West End blues or whatever, was deliberating about each note before it came out, it wouldn't sound anything like right. that. He clearly he isn't doing that. That's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, yeah. and even though some accounts of human action... So what, account what is it about the jazz improvisation that strikes you as particularly characteristic of, of freedom? Right. 
Well, I'm, I guess I, I almost, I start with phenomenological question. Like when have I felt free or right, when right. have I experienced another person as particularly free? And it's not when they are the Kantian lawgivers of themselves, you know, that they are rigidly moralistic and stuff like that, or that they can predict their own actions given their own principles, or I can tell what they're going to do before they do it because they are Kantian rational subjects or something like that. Those are lurid uh, falsifications of freedom. They're mere paradoxes, you know, like obedience to the moral law is freedom. Okay, that should ring as a just a paradox, all right? And it's, and it's not a plausible conception of human freedom, at least given what I think about the phenomenology of freedom, like when we think human beings are free. So, for example, violating a principle that you yourself recognize, all right, sometimes that's experienced as a kind of slavery, like you're being driven to do that by a vice or something. But sometimes that's exactly the moment of the experience of freedom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, violating the external law, or violating the law you give yourself. And yeah. this idea that being what, a rigid puritanical lawgiver of yourself 24 hours a day is a vision of human freedom, I think is insane. Well, I think it's, it strikes me as being essentially Pauline, right? I mean, it seems to me that this is, this is where you see Kant's Christianity come out. Um, 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 because it's very, very close to stuff that Paul says in Romans and Galatians about, about you know, that 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 what enslaves me are my own desires, not not my right. not 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 the better aspects right. of my nature, right? Right, um, and, it, um, and yeah, and yeah. it goes political too. Yeah, in, in in like say in Hegel, for example, where or even Rousseau, where the idea is obedience to the state's law is the freedom. Right. of the governed right you don't get too just, far yeah you know it's not too far before you get to that right from yeah. kant right um obedience that's kind of first of all internal obedience then justifies a kind of external obedience right um, right and, and these um, are political i think they're political conceptions of the self <laughs> yeah that you get in in kant and hegel but also in course guard and fisher yeah and the political picture is hierarchical and it's oppressive all right like you it's your freedom is a matter of parts of you subduing right. other parts, of you, the, the rational subduing the animal. Which is interesting because on the, in another vein, Kant is one of the sources of modern liberalism. Sure. So it's sure. a sort of our ironies all sure. over the place. Yeah. So you think that, that so, so I think I have a decent idea, at least what you're getting at about freedom. Um, I mean, I, could cont I would want to contest it a hundred different ways, but that's not the point here. Um, um, explain now how, why you think it's perfectly fine to ascribe moral obligations to people for things that they owe, that they did not freely do. All right, I think that that's it's not always perfectly fine to do that. Um, I mean, I try to deal with, for example, excuses in 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 cases like uh, you know, like you were describing the case of uh, you know where you're. Hypnotize and sent to rob a bank. Hypnotize, right. exactly. Everyone uh, would accept that excuse, right? Yes, I mean, if, I if it was so. demonstrated, right? Yes, and partly um, that's um, due to the fact that it's a, a human, another human controlling you. I mean, I think it's really a... Um, but, okay, for example, like dealing with a mentally ill person or with an addict, I mean, I guess I keep coming back to this example, but I hope it has wider implications. One question you're asking is, is this person acting freely? All right, but if you're dealing with that 24 hours a day, you're also very likely blaming them, no matter how you think about their agency. Explain uh, that. All right, that's, so, that's not obvious. Explain that. Um, well, I know. I, <laughs> look, let, all right, let me try something, a totally different type of move. Tort law. Okay. Okay, now we're trying to figure out who is responsible for the fact that your car blew up or something like that, okay? Now, actually, the responsibility is, is not likely to come down to who did what freely. Like who, you know, did the, surely, for example, like mm. say, the car is, say, say the car is badly designed. Is it relevant whether the designer was acting freely during the... Yeah, so you're saying it is relevant what agents and actors were involved in which yes. parts of the process. What isn't relevant is whether they were 
acting freely or not? You know, not sometimes yes, sometimes no. I want to say, you know, similarly in, in the in deleting the justification condition on knowledge, I, what I'm trying to show for one thing, just it's not necessary to all ascriptions of responsibility. So, I mean, people have found this ridiculous. I could never publish this material. Um, you know, like okay, so a dog, the dog just ate the Christmas turkey. You know. All right, like he, all right, is the dog responsible? Is the dog acting freely? I don't know. But we're starting, yelling, like, you know, bad dog, bad dog. You have to go outside now, you know. You're lucky if you ever get back in this place, you know. We but start that, is that not an effort in condition, simply in conditioning to try and prevent future turkey eatings? No, well, think about your mental state. You're angry. You're running through this kind of moral uh, vocabulary or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, even inanimate objects, I hate to say this, I have terrible uh, relations with inanimate objects. And when they you get, do? Yeah, yeah. When they get like, when they get balky or whatever, I start slamming them, breaking them and shit like that. I've been trying to deal with this like for a long time. But I hold them responsible, man. Like, uh, <laughs> that, no, but, but seriously, do you really think that you can even ascribe responsibility to, non, to non-persons? Mm-hmm. I do. I think we do it all the time. I think that's so typical and central to our moral. Discipline. But isn't that us? That just, I mean, isn't that best explained simply by us sort of anthropomorphizing and projecting? And, and, and in other words, why would you want to take that on face value? Well, why wouldn't you? See, I, I well, think. Well, because you, it's because I, because I can't give a ra- any sort of reconstruction of it. I mean, look, to some extent, extent, you have to make some concession to what for law. Yeah, but. You're the one doing a philosophical system. You have to give right. some concession to what philosophy does. And one of the things it does is give rational reconstructions of practices, right? Right. Otherwise, you don't, what it sounds really saying is you don't, need to, you don't need philosophy. Just take the world on its, on its face. Here's what it is. I yelled at, my, at the baseball, right? Right. And that makes right. perfect sense, right? right. <laughs> well, look, for example, Strawson, he, you know, and this is so big in, in ethical philosophy right now, ethics right now. You know, he talks about in terms of reactive attitudes. He wants to base a, like, sort of ground the possibility of ethics in our actual practices of reacting morally to particular situations. He wants to start there, not with, can we, you know, justify the categorical imperative rationally from the ground up, all right? So if you start seriously with our reactive practices, First of all, we have moral type reactions to all sorts of things that are not human beings. And second of all, many of our moral reactions to human beings just do not turn on, you know, or, or, or it, the freedom of the, of the act is not relevant, really. I mean, to our moral responses yeah. in many cases, all right? Uh, you know, I mean, another case is uh, responsibility for mental states, right? Um, so, you know, if I'm angry all the time, right, is that morally bad? Am I freely angry all the time, all right? You know, or if you showed that I was, like, if you go into my brain chemistry and, and you know, said, like, okay, no, he's being driven by, you know, it's kind of roid rage. He's got too much testosterone rolling or something like that. I don't think that compromises uh, the moral reactive attitudes that people have toward that or the moral content of the, you know, if I go out and commit a mass murder in that state or something like that. Um, I actually don't think the question, I don't think we have to dissect your, the brain to figure out there's no messed up condition in order to hold some, somebody responsible right. for that. Now, right. some of our practices do move in that direction, you know, insanity defense and so on. Although the laws in insanity defense is not merely a matter of being crazy. It's a matter of a very specific, right. can you recognize moral right. The, the right from wrong? I mean, I mean, it's a very specific, in, in that sense, I think the law actually does better than we do on, on this um, in terms of, I think we let that get a bit too muddled. Um, right, and but plus most people's intuitions I think don't necessarily run with the insanity defense. Like if you are a crazy mass murderer, you know, I think most people actually don't really think that that's so relevant. You know what I mean? Like, uh, okay. Yeah. And you're a dangerous evil person too. And we're going to execute you now. Yeah. I mean, our intuitions are at a minimum 
divided on questions like that. No, they're very, they're very conflicted on it. Yeah. It's not something, let me ask you, I'm wondering, this is now occurring to me. I'm wondering if part of the problem is, you know, because I find compelling a lot of these examples you're giving of, Hey, look, we have these moral, re we have these moral reactions to things that aren't persons and, and, and even to persons who we think perhaps aren't acting freely. Um, and I wonder whether part of the issue is that on a view like yours, we really want, might want to suggest that it's a mistake to too much separate moral values from aesthetic values from other sorts of values. In other words, part of my resistance is that maybe I'm thinking of moral as too discrete a category. In other words, yes, there is a certain absurdity to getting morally angry at an inanimate object, if I think, if I'm already thinking of more morality overwhelm and too overwhelmingly a enlightenment sort of way, yes, right? As exactly as a property of thinking persons, right? Yeah. Um, um, so, isn't this is part of what you're doing to say is like, look, we're over individuating these different areas of dimensions of value? Yes, I mean that's one thing. I, I think they should be integrated, but also, I mean, what's really driving it too is this idea. I feel like we're much more integrated into the whole physical universe than these views kind of purport. Like I'm, I'm asking like what kind of freedom could actually emerge if we are just like little knots in a whole material right. skein, right. like we're composed out of it. We're not like, if you really got rid of dualism entirely and you just, and you thought of human beings as completely integrated into the order of nature. I mean, just nothing in excess. And in fact, nothing probably even that distinctive about us in the order of nature. Uh, then I think you'd stop saying things like, okay, we have all this content, all these abilities, all these uh, that other things cannot possibly have. Like in a way, it's, it's flowing from my naturalism. Yeah. Because yeah. I keep feeling the undertow of dualism of various kinds or just like, like I say, self-congratulation, this idea like we're so amazing and anomalous in the order of the universe. And I'm much more concerned like with, okay, how do we emerge in and as part of this order? Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the only way, going back to your metaphysics, I mean, if everything is kind of material and then, you know, the only extent to which there are individuated objects is these sort of knots of these threads where these threads all come together to a nexus point, but even there, they're, 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 they have to be defined in relation to one another, then the idea that you're going to be able to I isolate different varieties of value uh, in such a sort of strongly discrete way yes. where aesthetic value and moral value are, are unrelated um, really betrays that metaphor, right? It's not possible sure. given that, that picture because yeah. the values themselves are going to be features of these knotted right. substance, substances, let's call them, and they're only going to be definable in terms of one another. And if you pull a little on one, it's going to even right. bleed into the other. Exactly. Or, right. Yeah. I mean. And, um, and political, like what I was just doing with political and ethical value, I'm saying like this model of the human subject is, is a, a political model and it's hierarchical and all this stuff. Uh, I mean, I think the values are playing together there. I mean, obviously ethical and political value are connected in a million different ways. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so let's let's just talk so one more thing in the area of ethics, and then we'll move on to political philosophy. Um, okay, so you've talked a little bit about what values are. You want to get away from this isolation of the subjective states of the of 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 the person as being the the sort of the sole locus of moral of, of values. That you think that values really are are, are diffused through all the elements that make up the knot that is the person in yes. that fabric, right? Um, 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 is that not right? Well, it, it's all the, <laughs> it's not only the parts of the knot that make up the person, but it's, it's features of the, of the, uh, you know, the macrame outside the person as well. Right, but I thought that, that in person. your ontology, those are going to be parts of the threads that make up the knot, right? I mean, in well, other that's words, true. You're that's not, you don't separate the individual from the, the no, world to that degree also. That's right. Okay, so, so, um, so I see, so, the, so values are, are part of these integrated nexuses that have these, in, you described four valences at least, um, and they don't, the ascription of them in the moral sense does not necessarily depend upon 
representing the individual in, in question as having acted freely. Um, now, ob this has obvious implications for the traditional moral philosophies. And let's just take, for simplicity's sake, utilitarianism and some sort of Kantian deontology as the most typical moral philosophies. Sure. Beyond their dependence on these notions that you, uh, that you reject, beyond that, what's wrong with modern moral philosophy? <laughs> and what direction, what direction do you want to see ethics go in? Well, um, all right. um, boy, that's a hard one. Um, I do like sort of Jonathan Dancy's particularism. Explain, say you know, a little bit uh, about that. What I mean, that means. I, well, I mean, and I'm not an expert. I, I would say I, I know less about ethics than most of these other areas, actually, in, in terms of the contemporary debate specifically. Right. Um, but I would, I, in some ways, <laughs> I'd want to de-emphasize general principles, I guess you'd say. Um, not that they have no possible role, but I would stop looking for what I guess the way I think about even a commitment to ethical principles, even to the categorical imperative is, and I argue this, I suppose, or I say it, um, it irretrievably involves a personal commitment. Okay. A resolution. If the categorical imperative has any purchase in reality, it has a purchase in particular people's heads as a resolution to behave in a certain way. I don't think there's any, I think all these systems attempt to offload responsibility for ethical beliefs and onto something external, whether it's God or whether it's reason, which I don't think it's going to help either really in a way like you, reason is not going to make you a good person. Okay. Uh, and reason is not going to guarantee that you are not wrong or that you're not behaving wrong. And is that because what reason at best can do is apprehend general principles and simply apprehending those is not sufficient to be good or, or bad? Yes. That's part of it. Yes. <laughs> yes. And if they have any purchase, that sounds like, that sounds like Aristotle. Almost. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. And I mean, I, I like that about Aristotle, right? It comes down to a kind of practice. It's not that he doesn't have general principles or, you know, yeah. uh, general but they, they're not enough to make you ethical. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah, I think yeah. more in existentialist terms, like because I don't think you can show of any ethical principle that it is objectively valid, all right, outside of anybody's consciousness. I think these principles mark personal commitments. So I guess what I would say, like in critique of ethics, uh, contemporary ethics, like especially in the analytic tradition, is that it loses that existential moment to some extent on many occasions. Like, so the, the attempt is to, you know, I don't know what the relation of the principle of utility, you know, so that there's still a problem. Does it follow from facts? Facts, You know, is, does it collapse the fact value distinction or right? Is it just an observation? I mean, Mill was in a mess about this already. Like, is it, um, you know, does the fact that people take pleasure in X, uh, you know, establish that X is good. How? Right? So, the, like, fact value, the utilitarians struggle with that. The only way I think to negotiate those kind of questions is just to say, this is how I am resolving to live my life. Is to make them ruthlessly particular, right? I yes. Mean, I mean, and, 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 yes, and I also think, right, you're not going to find a theory that's going to cover all your cases or all your situations. Yeah. I actually think like deontological reasoning is key in many situations. I think utilitarian, I mean, I, I myself think, okay, there's some things that I feel like are absolutely blind, binding, yeah. binding, yeah. binding. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, in other cases, it's certainly relevant what kind of suffering you're causing, whatever principle you're moving from and things like that. Uh, like, I think you're going to need an eclectic set of values and nothing is going to relieve you of the burden of deciding who to be and how to act in this situation or, you know, that kind of thing. You know? So I take it also that on a view like yours, consistency is not going to be a particularly, uh, a, 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 is not going to be a moral value necessarily, right? I mean, I mean, because if, 
if you're sort of denying the role of general, not just general principles, but the relevance of general features of scenarios, right? And I, and I, what I was thinking of was sort of like trolley problems, right? Right. I mean, it seems to me that the answer that someone, I thought that someone of a particular spent, one of the things they're going to want to say about trolley problems is that um, the problem is, is that the particular aspects of a particular situation are what are morally salient, right? Yes. And when you subtract them away, you strip away anything that's moral about the situation, and then it does become a purely a kind of a calculus that has nothing to do with actual moral reasoning. So yeah. the answer to the supply problem is to say that the trolley problem is not a moral problem. Right. right. I think um, that's true. Um, um, but um, I mean, I'm willing to play with thought experiments in general in philosophy. I don't eliminate them all. But in right. ethics, how could they be of any use right. if what you're saying is correct? Well, I also think that, like I, I kept saying, like, I think – General principles, it's not that they are irrelevant. It's that they represent a kind of resolution, even a resolution to stick together as a human being. You see what I mean? To, to be a person in a way. Like in, and okay, so I, I don't think they can possibly have the status that they seem to ascribe to themselves of being objective principles outside of anybody's, outside of any particular situation. But I think they, they can mark a resolve to become some kind of consistent person, which is not something that I regard as irrelevant or whatever. I mean, it's, it's limited, but it's something I aspire to myself, right? Like I, I want to be, be very responsive to particular interactions and situations, and I don't want to just bring a theory and smack it on to each thing. On the same, by the same token, I don't want to be a person that just randomly lies here, tells the truth there. You know, I want to forge a self by, in part, by holding myself, to, attempting to hold myself to certain principles, right? So I don't know if that sounds like a kind of subjectivism or existentialism in ethics. Well, I just wonder, I wonder how it, how it sits with the particularism. I mean, it does seem to me that if, you know, I've always thought that that, that consistency is just a, um, a bogus demand um, that fails to take seriously, you know, the fe the particular features of partic particular circumstances. Um, and so, you know. I'm not just straight endorsing particularism exactly either. I yeah, guess. It, it matters to me who the actors are. Yeah, oh, definitely. Right, so, so part yeah. of the reason I can't answer a trolley problem is because you didn't tell me who the various people are. Right. And that would make a difference. Right, or right. who you, self, you yourself are, actually. That's right, and so on Tuesday, I might push the guy on the track, on Wednesday, I might not because it's a different guy, and that makes me inconsistent in a way, right? Would you be but, wrong one of those times? or uh, I don't know. I mean, it depends, again, who the guy is. Yeah. Um, 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 there's a lot of people, I think, the best thing that could happen was for them to be pushed in front of trains. I mean, I mean, you know, um, right. this, um, you know, so, I'm a so pastor, man. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure you are. Um, I am actually, um, 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 but you know, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I wonder how you're going to, what use you're going to put principles to on this I think it's your metaphysics that's the problem. I mean, part of the problem is this thread knot metaphor gets right. you these – everything is a unique individual. Yes, true. And I don't know where yes. principles fit into a universe like that. Right, and in general, abstract objects, right? Like where do yeah. numbers fit into Yeah, it seems to me like, like you almost where? have to be a kind of yeah. a ruthless nominalist about almost everything. I kind of am. So then why do you care right. about things like right. consistency? You said you're trying to build a person and that part of the right. person has to do with these principles. Why right. do why? those matter? Right. Well, I mean, I, I guess I, I do struggle with this in the chapter. Yeah, that's why I, I'm asking I, you about it. And I, and, right, yeah, and I, I do, and I don't know if I struggle with it adequately at all. It's a really a dilemma, but I think it's like a human dilemma. Like we sort of have to fight to be individuals if we're going to be individuals. Is there a moral reason we should do that? No, not necessarily. Is there maybe an evolutionary reason we need to do that or something? Maybe sometimes, you know, uh, maybe not. But we're, so the individual is real. But so is the connection of the individuals and the relations of the individual. 
you know, you can't define the individual without its relations, but you can't define the relations without the individuals perhaps as well. So I, I sort of moving us toward the human dilemma of trying to forge an, uh, our, you know, of our obligation to be, to exist as individuals or our feeling that we need to in some way, um, as well as, you know, that individual in connection. So I think in some ways that's the function of ethics, in the, it's a function of ethical theory in, or principles in, to some degree, is that they, or the reason to be consistent in some way. Right. You know, right. I mean, it's, you you wouldn't know, want to, to deal with an inconsistent person, right? Who do, doesn't recognize the principles today that they recognized yesterday. You know, today they are, they don't know what you're talking about when, you know, you, I married you yesterday and you were committed to monogamy. But now you just don't care. You know what I mean? Like you don't recognize that anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah. That'll drive you insane. You know? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. This is not, in, in a way, the ethics chapter doesn't really address these abstract questions in meta ethics very effectively, I think. You know, it tries to move the questions into a different register. Right. About those things. Right, right. And that's actually what I, I you know, I, I'm interested in that. And so I guess part of what I was asking you when I said, what didn't you, what's wrong with traditional moral philosophy beyond the fact that they're invested in free will and all these other sorts of things? Part of what I was wanting you to do was to, to talk about, okay, I want to put this on a different footing. Okay, what's the different footing? What should ethics be about then, if not about, if not about coming up with general principles by which we then can decide what to do, what we do? Um, what do you think ethics should be, do, what should be about? Well, it is fundamentally about particular human connections. I think, you know, now I think that ethical principles can play in that, can, can be part of that in a way. Uh, they have to be, if they're anything. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize, first of all, the individuality, uh, disindividuation dialectic or whatever, like being a single thing and being many things. I think right. we're both, and we're fighting for that and around that all the time. You know right. what I mean? Right. Uh, I think that's the kind of thing that ethics should be about, I suppose. I mean, I'm willing to argue about general principles, you know, their, gen their status in general or a particular one or a particular one in a particular situation or with regard to a particular culture or subjectivity and so on. Um, I guess what I'm almost wondering is whether what you think ethics should really be is almost a kind of moral sociology. I mean, here's the reason I'm saying this. You know, this is the last thing I want to ask you about ethics because we really need to get to political <laughs> philosophy or else we're going we're gonna to go way too long. But here's another way of asking what I, was, what I was sort of getting around, and that is, do you think that there actually is normativity in any strong sense? Um, um, are there strong moral laws? Or not, or, or or do you think really this is more about a descriptive effort to engage in our social interactions with each other, with some norm, with some some with sort of some conception of what we, we hope would be the case or that we would like to be the case? But it almost sounds to me like you're not leaving a lot of room for any very strongly normative mo notions in ethics. But I have such notions. I find myself moralizing all the time. I know. I mean, and, I read yeah. your blog and I sort yeah. of, I know your public persona a little bit right. and I'm wondering, right. but do you think that that's not philosophically informable? I think it's not fully philosophically defensible, but I think that that is itself something that philosophy has to explore. Right. Mm. Like, so I think like the status of moral principles, even if you start saying, no, they can't be this, they can't be that. No, we, we need to move back to our practices in a certain way. It might be kind of a Wittgenstein way even uh, to understand these terms. Th those are still within the philosophical tradition of discussing the status of moral values and moral right. principles, even if they come off of this. I don't think moral principles can be what they are often presented as being uh, or what they seem to be like a Kantian categorical imperative. They can't have that sort of status. Nothing can you know, a universal moral law that applies to all Martians or all persons or whatever, but they can mark important moments, resolutions that play in a thousand ways in particular interactions. And also just evaluating things like in the news or something like that. It's not that they're irrelevant, 
And I, I would insist like discussing values or any issue like truth, for example, you know, like Rorty thought we should just stop talking about truth. Well, he had reasons that he thought we should stop talking about truth. I'm going to say that that is philosophy. That's, that's squarely in the middle of the philosophical discourse. It's yeah. philosophical discourse about what the status of truth is, even if it melts that status finally. You know what I mean? Like he's not past right. philosophy when he does that. Right. And I'm not p- past philosophy. And I'm also not simply dismissing moral principles, although I do think the principle of utility is not going to get us very far. But <laughs> Yeah. It's yeah. almost as if, in some very deep sense, you want to reject the idea that philosophy's job is primarily to give theories, right? I mean, I mean, it sounds like well, a lot of theories though in this book though too, right? Yeah, but they're yeah. weird theories. I mean, they're, they're theories that kind of almost disintegrate when you kind of look at them. Or they're, they're theories that are theories. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's do, let's do some political <laughs> philosophy. Um, God, <laughs> it's a good thing you, you quit drinking because I, I actually had this flash that I could see me and you spending about 20 years in a bar. Um, <laughs> that was the best part of my drinking, man. I was drinking with people like you rapping all night about That's the problem, problem right? It's, it's, That's the good part. Although, is that a problem, right? The, or is the problem that the world doesn't permit it to go on, right? I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> they should pay us to sit in bars and do this. Um, Hell yes. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Political philosophy. Now, here again, you know, it's interesting. Both this chapter and the ethics chapter, I thought, were oddly constructed in light of traditionally how philosophy is done. So, ethics, there's barely any talk of sort of, you know, your traditional moral philosophies until you get really deep into the chapter. And even there, it's sort of coming. It's pretty superficial. And in the political philosophy, there's a similar thing. I mean, there's a bit more where you go after Rawls, but. It's all this preliminary stuff that's so interesting, and that seems to me what you're, where you're real interested at. It almost seems to me like you're doing political science um, um, more than you're doing political philosophy, or maybe political theory more than you're doing political philosophy. Um, yeah. But so, well, you know, I am influenced on all these things by people like Foucault or people like Wittgenstein. I hate to say it, being a, a sort of anti-Wittgensteinian in various ways, is I'm not like distinguishing the philosophical abstract questions from the particular empirical question. Yeah, yeah. It's like, so a Nietzschean genealogy or something like that strikes me as potentially philosophically relevant. Right. I right. don't pause to distinguish those things very carefully. Like, I think like if I'm going to come up with a general theory or something, it's going to emerge. It might emerge out of historical data. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or at least it has to engage in that in various ways. And so I'm, I'm definitely coming off of some kind of picture of philosophy as asking these general eternal question although that is my picture of philosophy <laughs> but i'm engaging in, in this in this i guess genealogical way is yeah it's pretty delicate i mean and i haven't yet decided yet whether i think you whether it works but i mean you are doing philosophy but at the same time you are really rejecting a lot of what philosophy typically does, right? right. Or are um, the distinctions between philosophy and sociology and political science and stuff? There's a lot I'm of definitely bleeding. not trying to observe those strictly in some way. Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely not. And you know, it's it's ironic you know, that you just what you just said the way you said it strikes me as obviously what you're getting at on three thirty seven, right at the beginning of the section on political philosophy. Okay, right. So this is actually one of these great passages. I'm just going to read some of this because it's. Uh, it's so good. Um, so political philosophy has to start in concrete situations with infinitely individual and infinitely relational persons. It has to start from taking persons seriously as making a moral claim that is from a resolution towards real relations with real things. Now here, here's the key sentence. The characteristic derangement of political philosophy begin to treat persons in abstraction as representations or texts in terms of general will, for example, or nations, epistemological or aesthetic markers that destitute real organisms. Indeed, textualism is at the heart of the modern nation state. Its cult of law, its demographic surveillances, its modes of control. The state fantasizes a global transformation of person by texts, pledges, anthems, standardized tests, spreadsheets of bureaucratic functions that one person can fulfill as well as another. This is uh, really, A, it's really well written, but B, it's, it's, it almost sounds to me like 
you think political philosophy to a certain extent created the state. Do you think that that's the case? I do. And, and what do you mean in the sense, what does this mean, I, this expression about turning, that it's, it's at the heart of the modern nation state to turn people into texts. Right. Okay. So explain that. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I guess I wouldn't really say that philosophy created the political state. It, it's a. It's mutual causation or whatever. I think um, philosophy, political philosophy, emerged largely in an attempt to justify the practices of states. But it also. Do you mean that in general or just modern political philosophy? Modern, because, because I mean, the I, ancients took the state as the part of the natural condition of the human being, right? I mean, that's the whole point of Aristotle, right? Is that people are naturally political, right? And I think we have to worry about the term state here too when we. Oh, so you want to, might want to say there weren't any states in ancient uh, Greece? I think it's a it's a hard, long question. You know, there's certainly not something like. Well, you know, yes how much should you say to clarify for the audience? I'm going to leave you to say it. You've heard all these things I've asked and things. That I, yes. Talk me through that little first passage right. a little bit in light of what we've just been batting all around. Right. Now, I, I think that state, the modern nation state, treats hu human beings as abstractions. It, Explain. It, it proceeds by, it can't proceed except by generalizing human beings into categories and you know so you so so for example income categories so you know how much you can extract from them uh but also racial categories linguistic categories ethnic categories gender categories and so on how about just that, citizenship Is yeah that itself yes distinguishing citizens from non-citizens mm -hmm. okay. and these, these are really remarkably arid concepts, but they do permit when used with a, some kind of surveillance regime, which has been developing in the, all of modernity toward where, where we are now. Um, and maybe it's particularizing more now because the surveillance is so much more effective in some ways. But if you want to control a population, you have, this is Foucault really, you have to know the population. Okay, and that, and a way, and you can't know each person in the population because you're just sitting in the capital with your bureaucracy right. or whatever. Uh, which you can, so you have to sort them into categories to start. So with. you know them by way of sort of social science, is what you do. You, you kind yeah. of. Yeah, I mean, yes, and you know them by generalizing them into categories. Uh, again, you know, age, race, gender, profession income levels, regions, and so on. Now, it's not that that makes no sense or that it never has any purchase in reality, but using that in the service of controlling populations, I think is just the absolute, that's the sine qua non of the modern state. That's what it's for, that's how it operates. And it has terrifying implications when it starts to, break down or like, for example, when you start to say, okay, you know, we're going to have to uh, liquidate the reactionaries, you know, or the, or like the, uh, the kulaks, you know, the upper end of the peasantry or something like that. Okay. We've got this category of people and now we're going to have to move them all to Siberia or something like that to, to create this, you know, fantastical really transformation of social life that the state promises or, you know, attempts to institute the modern state. And I do think like the whole history of modernity has been characterized by ever increasing state power. I mean, if there's one single political phenomenon that goes from the 17th century to now, it is growing state power that shows no sign of abating right. and that does show some sign of extinguishing the human species right but it's the abstraction because of wars part. because of wars and things like that yeah like, wars like, genocides nuclear weapons industrial uh, industrial devastation that sort of thing that too yeah, but i mean yeah. that's not all the states doing you yeah, know yeah. uh either but um but it's it but it's not not the states doing either Right. And, and, and so I think that when you abstract, and I guess this goes back to maybe some of the stuff in ethics, when you treat people as abstractions, 
you know, you, you're very likely to end up using particular people as mere means, let's say, or not even caring about their continued existence as particulars, but only treating them in this generalized, textualized way, like yeah. you, you yeah. under this term. Yeah. I guess what, part of what I'm trying to, what I'm hoping we're going to get to, um, where I'm sort of trying to direct things, is, is to ask whether... I mean, one thing you could say is that, well, look, there's really nothing wrong with political life per se. I mean, in, in the sense that Aristotle understands it, what's simply wrong is that the political entities have gotten too large, and because they're so large, they now have to be managed by systems that really can't manage things without doing what you're talking about. Right. Um, but I was under the impression that your um, that your anarchism and 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 for the viewers who don't know, um, you are you are self-identified as an anarchist. Yes was more a rejection of politics in a more fundamental way. And, but everything you've been saying to me thus far sounds to me like a problem with scale. I mean, this is something Rousseau argues in The Social Contract, right? He says, look, I think it's in a footnote. He's like, I doubt that what I'm describing could be done in something much larger than Cyprus, right? right. Or, or Cor I forget which one right. it was, but it was something like that, right? <laughs> um, so why is this not just a problem of size and then the requirement of administrative bureaucracies? Why is this something well, that's, fundamentally wrong with political yeah. life? That's one problem is, is size. But uh, I think you can treat people as abstractions locally too. You know, I mean, I think you could do that in your little schoolhouse with your group of children, for example, uh, very locally without maybe any supervision. You could do it in your family. You know, like you could treat, uh, you know, your child is just an example of right. a delinquent right. or something like right. that. Right. Um, and so is I the problem with the state or is the problem with political life at okay. all? Okay, let me try. Okay, so if Aristotle says, you know, human beings are naturally political animals, I don't necessarily disagree with that. We are collective, you know, we, we, in the sense that we, we're together. You know, we have to try to work out ways to make that happen. I mean, We're that's not, anthropologically sustainable now I think with, so. with, I think with so. evolutionary biology. I think there's pretty yeah. wide consensus that we are a cooperative yes. species. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, not just, and, and not just social, as Aristotle yeah. said, but yeah. just political in some more self-conscious sense. Like, we have to work on arranging our lives and, and make decisions right. about that. Right, right, um, right. I think that's okay. I mean, where I hop off is just coercion, Okay. That's where that's where I think this whole thing is. But how is can there not be coer any? Uh, how can there be no coercion in any collective system, unless the people involved are so homogenous that there's no chance that they're going to disagree? Well, I I don't think that that's necessarily true. I mean, look, you can have a bowling league with people who disagree. Uh, right, and somebody has to be in charge of it, and then thus, if no, some if two people no. on the team of fifty don't want to do something and the rest do, then sorry, the team is doing this. No, no, that's no, coercion. No, 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 it's not necessarily. I, there's all not right. much. There's not. Look, first of all, what do you mean right, by coercion, coercion then? A matter of degree. And it may be that we won't live without any form of coercion or whatever, but I think we can live without, we can live much more than we do without massive coercion. And it's always a, it's always an ethical problem. That is, what gives us the right to coerce you? Now, the idea that human collective life or political life is impossible without coercion, like that's a Hobbesian type of, of view, um, I think it's the common sort of view. Like we can't possibly be together and engage in cooperative activity without coercion, or at least on a large scale. Right. If that's true, I think our extinction is desirable. I think we're a grotesque species and we will be extinct anyway. And I think it's obviously false because we engage in all kinds of cooperative activities all the time without, you know, thorough gun to your head, uh, sprawling system of incarceration type of coercion. Okay. And the, our idea that human beings cannot live together without wide-scale coercion is a, it's a devastating indictment of the people who believe that about themselves. And it's a devastating indictment of modern philosophy, political philosophy. And like I say, if that's true of us, we don't deserve to exist, man. And it's not true of us. And, and the fact that people just generally believe that 
is one reason why there is no way out of this state thing, it, why there's no way out of war, why there's no way out of oppression, polarization, uh, and mass incarceration and violence and all this. We believe of ourselves that we can't cooperate except by being forced. That is, I feel, I feel like it's silly, it's well, evil, let's, and it's self-fulfilling. So let's be specific. I mean, look, I mean, part of the problem is this, is that, I mean, it, it, it could be the sort of, you know, you, you could wind up in a situation where it's just like, well, we all agree that, that, that the elimination of all coercion is probably not possible. But it's just a but it's a matter of these sort of toxic the sort of toxic notions of coercion, and then we can start having an argument which are the toxic ones and which aren't, and then that, that's not very interesting. So I mean, I, I mean it's interesting at another level. It's not interesting that interesting in philosophy. I mean, so I guess I want to ask you. Let's talk about a specific something specific then, right? So I mean, um, let's take something that's really contentious, right? So so um, you know I live in a state where the people uh, overwhelmingly absolutely did not want for gay people to be allowed to get married. Okay. Right. And you know, my parents live in a state where people overwhelmingly do want people to have uh, gay people. You know, my parents live in New York. Yeah. I live in Missouri. Okay. Yep. Um, much to my eternal <laughs> misery. Um, and um, okay. So, so how tell me the story of how that right. all gets settled without anybody being <laughs> coerced all right well in in a way see it's hard to be an anarchist in this way because you, you know i'm going to have to tear down all the existing structures to get you there and that's not going to happen you know so or, or give me the I mean, anarchist analysis i'm not even right. saying give me a practical okay, solution well, but i'm saying yeah. talk me through this story in a way we that doesn't involve any coercion well, we don't actually have to decide who gets to get married, do we? Not collectively, not by vote. You know, our leaders, our governors, our professors, our whatever our elites are, they are not under any obligation to tell other people what their family arrangements should be. Uh, nor are other people, you know, under any obligation to listen to what they say unless they have coercive power of some kind, unless something turns on that. So in a situation where there is no government of Missouri, I guess, you know, I, okay, so then we imagine mob, homophobic mobs and stuff like this, and I can try to try to work through some of that in one way or another, and I'm not denying that there could be real, real bad problems along those lines. What I'm saying is the idea that we have to decide together who can get married, and then guys with guns and, and jails will enforce that. That's just a fantastical statism that is oppressive no matter how it's applied. You know what I mean? Like we are not under an obligation to make those decisions for one another. Right. So let's say so let's so let's say one of the moves is going to be look, you know, who says we have to have official marriages anyway, right? Anybody yeah. can make whatever family arrangements they want. Anybody, okay, fine. Let's say we do that, right? Right. Um and now uh you and your you and your uh male husband are um, traveling and uh, you, you, some you get into a car wreck in Missouri and the people in the, the, the hospital say, go fuck yourself. You're not allowed right. to go see this man. I don't give a care. As far as we're concerned, you right. have no relationship to him whatsoever. Now, again, I don't see how, unless you're going to, right. I mean, if you're just going to say, look, you'd have bad shit go on also in my, in my picture, it just would yes. be less worse <laughs> But then, well, then again, we get into what seems like an uninteresting argument. Like, oh no, it would be worse. It's worse for, it's worse for the state to make the hospital work, f help you, than it is for the hospital to refuse to help you. Well, uh, in, in I, that I don't know if I think that's case, true. I mean, all right, no, it's not true. Yeah, that, you know, in, in that case, that's not true, right? It's it, it's it's not worse for the state. So, is there some story you can tell me that doesn't get us into these sort of tangles that don't seem all that interesting? I mean, okay, so I guess my idea is just that: um, to what extent could we move? All right, I mean, just to say, just to say it on the other side, okay? Yes. You have, like, for example, state intervention to uh, end segregation of Southern schools, for example. Right. Or, Great. Even right. better example. Yeah. Than, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good thing. 
But you also had state power that enforced that in the first place, right? You have anti-miscegenation laws. You have uh, separate equal court decisions, stuff like that. And in fact, the it seems to me that the hierarchical racial structure of society, Thoreau said this among many others, could only be created by wide scale state coercive arrangements. Okay. So the fact that you can use the state in to some extent to ameliorate conditions produced by look, we do, we should think about what kind of society we want to live in. We want to live in a society that has a, rigid hierarchy of coercive force that corresponds with a rigid hierarchy of resources and so on. Like, and, and is basically irretrievable because once you have irresistible coercive force, there's essentially no practical resistance. Right. Do we want to live in a permanently hierarchical society in all dimensions? If we, and it will be applied in an oppressive way, in general, in fact, the whole system is a oppressive because the the per- people operating on the coercive system, demonstrably, I would say, have no more right to do that than the people at the bottom have to do it to the people who are operating the power. All right, and if we if you want to settle into a permanent hierarchy that rests finally on violence, then I guess that's where we are, and it's getting more and more intense because there is no redress. Yeah, right. But yeah. if we want to move towards something that begins to tear down both political hierarchies and at the same time the correspondent uh, economic hierarchies, for example, we are going to have to face various bad results of that as well. Uh, but I think that what I want to do is try to reimagine a society that begins to just where those, those hierarchies begin to disintegrate instead of just continually intensifying. One thing is that if you have a, a group of people that have all the armed force and stuff like that, you know, basically a, a monopoly on armed violence and, you know, again, incarceration and all that, uh, there's no way to get over that. There's no, uh, there's no redress for that. There's no, uh, and it will often, have disastrous results, genocidal results. Yeah, yeah. You cannot, yeah. it's the, the killing fields, the Holocaust, uh, these are not right. possible without state, without state power. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yes. right. That's right. And, that's and, absolutely right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, no. I see, seem like we're going to get into a groovy anarchist paradise because we do suck. You know what I mean? Like, they're, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. No, but so much of what you were just saying now, I mean, It's not so much, you don't so much diss political philosophy, but I do, I do think maybe you sort of underestimate it a little bit in the sense that so much of what you were saying now is precisely what, Locke, what someone like John Locke is trying to work through in the section on the sure. state of nature. Sure. And it seems to me that Locke, much more so than Hobbes and, and, and the others, really does take seriously the question of is it really better to leave the state of in other words, he he, yeah. he he does not just immediately dismiss the state of nature as sort of you know some obviously miserable condition. Absolutely. Um, and and so I guess there's a lot I like about Locke. I guess. Yeah, I guess one of the things I would want to ask you, granting all the shortcomings of the thought experiment, what as in your version of your form of anarchism, what is your way of grappling with the state of nature thought experiment? And the con- sort of considerations that Locke inquires into right. regarding the relative advantage of continuing to exist in such a state versus accepting some sort of political authority, which will have some sort of monopoly on power. Right. Well, I mean, I guess one way I try to work through this, to some extent, is some of the anthropology and stuff that's been done around this, uh, like David Graeber's work and uh, James C. Scott, who's one of my favorite contemporary thinkers. Um, of course, like a lot of people, I'm going to say that the state of nature thing is a fiction. Right. I said, uh, granting all the, the, the problems yeah, yeah. with it, though, but let's, so much of what you said seemed to me to be engaging those questions. Right. Okay. So um, w- one thing I just would emphasize is how capable we are of cooperative activity that does not rest basically on coercion and how many successful societies 
have actually occurred in what we would call a state of nature. All a state of nature means is a pre is a pre state condition. You know what I mean? And I do you think, think that, that human cooperative behavior is possible without agreements and contracts? Yes. But I think that there's nothing wrong with agreements and contracts as well. Well, no, but the reason I ask is because it seems to me if you think that it requires agreements and contracts, that then you've already kind of agreed that there have to be authorities. Right. Maybe. But maybe not. But I mean, sure. I think we can engage all kinds and we always, we often do, right? In general, we do engage in cooperative activities without agreements and contracts. You know, oh, I mean, yeah, no, I agree with that. that. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, so that's possible for sure. Yes. It's true, like, okay, so, you know, if you are going to enter into agreements and contracts, then the question arises, how can this be enforced? You know, and that will get you pretty quick, like in a game theoretic way, almost to uh, a state, you know, that's right. Uh, that's right. That's, why that, I asked, yeah. that's why I asked. That's why I asked it, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, I, I, of course, I feel the force of agreements, even when I when there is no enforcement mechanism, like, so that, but that's just because you're a great guy. Uh, well, no, what about like, the like, jerk next door who doesn't feel the force of personal agreements? Well, so yeah, I know. But I mean, <laughs> so like in a case where, um, you know, when I've gotten married, right, there's a state aspect to that. Maybe even we had a religious figure, you know, God is enforcing the agreement or whatever. But guess what? No, I'm just taking real seriously. The fact that I committed to being with you and now, I also have withdrawn from those, you know, and the cops didn't show up at my door and say, no, no you, you know, right. you, you have to stay faithful to this woman for the rest right. of your life or whatever. Right. Or we're going to imprison you. Uh, but I think like we, you know, we enter into agreements for all sorts of reasons. And of course, often it's in our self-interest to continue to observe agreements, whether they're enforced or not, or however they're enforced. But, uh, what I'm interested in is to what extent we can live together without coercion. Now, I'm not saying maybe that it, it's possible to live without any coercion and stuff like that. I mean, I think we can, but I do think we can live with a lot less coercion than we have. And that most human political activities, even most human cooperative activities, even now, do not basically rest on coercion. You know, like, am I doing my job at Dickinson because I'm under contract because I've agreed to, because I'll lose my, well, yeah, kind of, I am, uh, partly, but I'm also doing it because I've committed to doing it. I said I would teach these classes or whatever. I show up not because I'm under threat, but because this is, you know, what I've, what I've agreed to do. But and doesn't, I, doesn't Locke acknowledge that? Doesn't Locke essentially say, yeah. look, most people in the state of nature would regulate themselves. Yeah. The problem is that you don't need very many to refuse right. to do so, to basically render everyone else in a position where yes. they really can't pursue their good fully and most effectively because they have to spend a good amount of their time and resources concerned yeah. with the small number of people who are not going to uh, uh, self-regulate. Okay, well, this is what I would say. That small number of people who are not going to self-regulate, that is the state come off the fiction and ask yourself who is in charge of this thing and why, and you'll find out it's conquest and violence. That is, it's the people who cannot or will not regulate themselves by uh, the social contract, for example, who are, that's the origin of the state, man, thugs, okay? So that's the situation we're in. We are being run by precisely the people who are, for one thing, exempted from the social contract explicitly, okay? Right. And, but yeah. Although they're not supposed to be. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, a, misappl that's a misapplication. I mean, Locke is very explicit that, yeah, but, that everyone but, has to, otherwise it doesn't work, right? I mean, I no, mean, but you can't, you can't have police that are subject to the same laws as we are. Well, they have to be in the Lockean system, but the Lockean contract. But they cannot possibly be. Okay, so for example, if a cop uh, grabs me on the street after I commit a crime, you know, handcuffs me and throws me in the back of his car, he's doing something, he's kidnapping me, he's assaulting me, and he's not subject to the laws of kidnap and assault. Okay, like you cannot have a state where the people who operate state power 
are subject to the same laws as the people over whom they are. That's just a fiction, man. The, the, this idea of the rule of law is really quite silly in a lot of ways. Every function of state power requires exemption from the social contract specifically, if there is such a thing. Yeah. So, uh, so is, is your argument that Locke's theory is actually incoherent because he, requir he requires that the sovereign be a part of the contract? In that sense, you, you'd say Hobbes is, is the only the only realistic version of it, well, where, the, he, where the sovereign is outside of the social contract. He's realist about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and um, I mean, that's true, I think. Yeah, yeah, and this is not an argument to have here. I mean, I, I profoundly disagree with all, almost all of, all of this, but it's not the place to have this argument. Sure. Um, I do, though, want to go back to the base point, because this strikes me as the really interesting thing, and it's where, where I do think it's, it's profitable to push you from the standpoint of understanding your book. Um, <sighs> I agree with you entirely that there's all sorts of levels of cooperation that we can engage in that require no third party coercive force whatsoever. I would argue, however, that they all would tend to be pretty small scale endeavors. In other words, here's what I'm getting at. I, I, I'm not, let me not dance around it. Is the kind of cooperation required for a certain level of advanced civilization? Here's what I'm getting at. I could imagine an anarchist world like the one you're talking about, but it would be one that was pretty low industrial and it would be one where everybody died when they were about 40 or 50. You would not have, to have the lifespans we have now requires a tremendously sophisticated medical infrastructure that requires tremendous amounts of coordination and capital, capital all of which involves states. And I guess what I'm asking is, would I rather live in a world where everybody lived to be 40 and your neighbor could just come and polax you, and or would I rather live this way? And honestly, I'd rather live this way. Uh, I'd rather live well, live where I can go to Miami Beach in two weeks and and eat right. in four star restaurants. Honestly, right. That, 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 so, so that's not crazy. What I'm asking is, talk. Yeah. Do you, a, do you think that that's true? Are you saying, look, I don't care that much about large scale endeavors, or do you want to deny even that? I I I guess I do. Like in the. I'm not sure. I haven't lived in a stateless world, although, you know, the state's domination of every aspect is not complete or even any aspect. I would like to know to what extent we are capable of large scale cooperative activities w without the threat of coercion or without so much coercion, at least. Uh, so, I mean, I wonder about, say, the development of medical technologies and so on. Is that possible in a stateless society? You know, I'm not really sure. And the reason I ask is because in the book, you specifically say, and you're right about this, um, you link states to capital. Yes. You say no state, no capitalism. So one of the, one of the fictions yes. that you very effectively skewer is this notion that somehow statism and capitalism are separate. You say they're absolutely com combined, they're unified. You don't that's get- That's why the left-right spectrum doesn't work out. Right, right, right. And, 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 and now that's all right, but, but that does then cost you something, right? If you want to admit that sort of state and capital are linked this way, then one of the things you're going to have to admit is that large-scale accumulations of capital that are required for large-scale infrastructural projects require mm. states. <sighs> well, <laughs> You're not going to get modern medical systems without capital and states then. Well, no, there may be alternative ways to do that. Just because those systems coincide in our experience, it doesn't mean that there's, I mean, I guess you could point to, you know, this is what anarchists do point to often, things like, say, Wikipedia or something like that. Well, See? yeah, that's interesting. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Do you think that or, things like crowdfunding, like yes. Kickstarter, show us yes. that you actually can accumulate tremendous amounts of capital? Yes, Yes, and, and pursues at least some larger scale projects, I guess. And I, I would like to see a lot more localism. I don't see why the United States has to be one political unit, uh, if it is, you yeah. know, or Europe, for example, you know, has to be one political thing or what's desirable and necessary about that. So I'd like to see, yeah. I would like to see us devolve toward more localism. It's true that I think like if we couldn't, have any technological, you know, much in the way of technological advance. It's true that if we lived to be 40 in an anarchist world, these would be like completely serious. Could you have had an industrial revolution without states and capital? 
Because look, it's the well, industrial revolution. That's like the reason. The one we had. But, like it, that. but that's the re- the industrial revolution is the reason why you have had the unprecedented levels of standard of living and quality of living increases in the modern Western world. Right, and that's also, the reason why lifespans are double. That's the reason why right. lifespans are double. That's okay, the reason but why. It might also be why you have incredible immiseration of the third world and also third world sections of the first world. Uh, it also may be why you develop things like nuclear weapons. Oh, I, no, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt, war. no doubt. Why you have climate change. Right, like no doubt. Uh, so the question then is, which is worse? You know, and again, yeah. you're, set, you're putting a Lockean a hard, argument, right? I yeah. mean, it's, it's a hard question, which is worse when, and I don't, honestly, I don't know the answer. But you I, have a hunch, you do. You think that I, this is worse. I do, kind of. And I think it might end us all. And you think but, that stuff like Kickstarter and Wikipedia shows you that even within this model, there are glimmers that we could have done this yes. a different way is what you're yes. almost saying. And a lot of things we did sort of do in a different way, or, or it's not only that that made these things possible. You know, it's not only state and capital that make medical, you know, advances in science possible or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Although they're not disconnected either, you know. Um, Talk a little bit about the left-right pro- the mistake, the left-right mistake, because that's, a, the whole audience will be interested in that because a lot of politics on blogging heads, and B, it's really important to your book so and to your sure. views per- personally. Sure. What's wrong with the left-right uh, okay. right des- uh, descriptor of our politics? Yeah, I think the whole taxon is a complete mess. I don't think it um, – okay, so I think there's two things it could be. It could be a commitment to a, a certain set of positions as a leftist or a rightist, It could be like a sort of propaganda structure for delineating opinions, or it could be a political science structure for understanding the possible political positions, the spectrum of political positions. And I think in either way, it's just a complete mess. So I really, I think it's invented for propaganda purposes by what we would call the left or what the left calls themselves the left. And I mean, just to raise like, okay, so first of all, the basic problem is the disconnection of state and capital. So it almost sometimes seems like left, right just means uh, state, capital. Right. All right. But those are not opposing forces. And I give a set of arguments for that in here. They're historically inextricable forces, and they form a single hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, what I call squishy totalitarianism or whatever. That's right. like, yeah. so like the government of China is an example of this. Like, do you think state and capital are opposing forces in the no. Chinese economy or whatever? And that's kind of the model, I think, of the emerging economy. I think that the so, success of those states, I think even for lay people, has kind of put to bed this, this possibility of defining things this way. Yes, I, I agree. Mean, you shouldn't, I so. Singapore shouldn't be successful economically. Right. If those two variables are separate, right? I right, mean, exactly. Right? Yes. right. And the whole history of capitalism is impossible without the state. You know, that's right. even Adam that's Smith right. said that. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. 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 And I, I do that in the book. Yeah. So that that conceptuality isn't going to work. And in fact, so that if you're a leftist, you know, and you're and you think that means more state power and less power of capital, you're in quite a like a practically incoherent position. And you're very likely to produce a more of an economic hierarchy or like a structural problem yeah. stalled economic hierarchy. Again, China would be a nice example of this. Or, and I mean, another way into this would be time through time. Like the right wants to go backwards in time and the left wants to go forwards faster. Yeah. Okay. You're going to have to do something better than that because that's really, really silly. All right. But uh, so, I mean, I, I would grapple with that conceptuality, but it seems tendentious. And obviously, it's a piece of propaganda in itself. Like, we want to go forward to the future. These right. people want to take you back to the medieval. But do, you think, but do you think that there are, that the use of left to right, maybe in less ambitious ways, in, in smaller scale ways, can be informative? So, for example, distinguishing between people who, on the one hand, think we should pay a lot of attention to, 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 to traditions and people who think we really shouldn't, right? Or people who think that the group is more important than the individual, or people who think that the individual is more important than the group. Um, those seem like they could be useful ways yeah. of distinguishing orientations. Yes, but they, I don't know that they go that well with the left and right either. Uh, I mean, first of all, right... So, j- what, what's right on the right side tends to be whatever's not left. 
So, okay, so libertarians are right wingers. You know, Ayn Rand super capitalists are right wingers. Right. So are royalists or the traditional Catholic Church. Right. And that's already a mess. That's already a mess, right? That's Evangelical a mess. Protestants. Right. That's a mess. Uh, yeah. Yes. Fascists. Yeah. 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 Okay. Those are they they are at least as opposed to one another as they are to whatever you call. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like so And you just don't think that there's gonna be any grouping that's gonna make any sense of the of those you just listed yeah. all these groups, you know, fascists, right. communists, uh, business right. tycoons. Well, there's not going to be any grouping. They're going to say, okay, right. these people are on this side and these people are that right. side. And some of them are collectivists, right? Like a nationalist view. Yeah. Like a, like a hyper-nationalist view. Yeah. That's a kind of collectivism, right? The basic yeah. subject is the nation. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, as opposed to a classes or races or whatever it might be on the other side. Yeah. No, I don't think there's any hope of making this make sense. Now, on the other hand, though, everyone seems to identify with it and they somewhere on it, most people, and they That's don't- because of media, don't you think? You kind of. Yeah, or it's- It's, it's, it's largely a media-driven narr narrative. I mean, it's probably due to media, but the people in media are just people like the rest of us who have, just can't think our way out of this thing. Yeah. You know, it's just like a reality and so it, almost, it doesn't matter that it's a conceptual, complete, incoherent mess with terrifyingly yeah. bad results. I wonder if it's almost an, if it's almost an offshoot that we're, if you're ever going to have political communications, so to speak, you're going to have these kind of efforts, because we, because, and especially if political communications are going to take the form they take in modern mediums, True. you have to be able to encapsulate things in in categories because you only have four minutes before the commercial comes or or well and, and you're gonna need to, <laughs> you're gonna need to fold up all your opponents into one category and lob them into the trash can together you know what i mean but it, but this this whole thing antedates mass media well not mass media but it antedates you know cable news or whatever yeah but it's yeah. it's in a particularly bizarre intense phase yeah i don't know that left and right in such a stupidly simplifying way predates modern communications. All you might be much. right. Um, you might um, be right. Um, you know, you know, I don't think when I think of this, I don't think if you go much sort of pre Lippman, it doesn't really, you know what I mean? It doesn't have the form it does now really. And it's not as yeah. stupid. It strikes me as not right. being quite as stupid um, <laughs> as it is sort of today, which is very uh, stupid. Um, last thing, let me just ask you, um, What do you see the role of a political philosophy, if any? What is the use of theories like, you know, regardless of what, whether you like Rawls or Locke or Rousseau or um, Nozick, or is there a role for philosophical theories of politics? Well, and if so, what is it? Yeah. Well, what, I mean, one thing I'd say is like, I'm not doing philosophy primarily because I'm concerned with the practical effects. Like, I find the, the questions intrinsically interesting, wh whatever their practical effects. Um, but I do think that in political philosophy, it has been remarkable at times how much effect political philosophers have had. It's shocking, really. Uh, I mean, I don't know that ethics or aesthetics or epistemology have ever produced these kind of results like, say, Confucian China or, you know, the effect of Locke on, right, on a modern, series of democratic yeah, revolutions, yeah. you know, or Marx. I, I think mean, the only other area you could say philosophy of having that level of influence is with respect to uh, natural science. Um, that's the only, because natural science came out of philosophy, naturalistic that's philosophy. That's true. Right. right. Um, um, it gave yeah, us the mechanical revolution. It gave us the mechanical revolution. That's the only thing I can yeah. think of that's as big as what political philosophy did, right? Yeah, I, mean, I agree. And, yeah. And so, but on, by the same token, I don't expect my own work to have those kind of effects, and most political philosophers don't. I, I don't know that Rawls would ever have those kind of effects, even or whatever, or Nozick or something. These are yeah. pretty abstract structures, um, but you never know. But I do find the questions intrinsically interesting, and my own views have been changed over the years in various ways by reading political theory and stuff. Um, so I think that, and again, like when I look at people like Graeber, who is really a fine political theorist, if you ask me, but also like a leader of Occupy and stuff like that. Like, I think he's actually trying to bring these ideas and people are finding them inspiring and finding what they want to do in his ideas to some extent. And, you know, so I think it can have some practical effects. I don't know. 
I wouldn't expect that from my own work, for example, or from most work really, yeah. but you know, and whether it does or not, I'm intrinsically interested in the questions. I just wondered whether, cause you're very critical in the book of some of the modern, the very prominent modern political philosophers, especially Rawls. True. Um, and I wonder whether that's just you talking through stuff that interests you and what you think is sort of wrong with it and, and, and or whether you think because of the practical intent of at least political philosophy, you know, ethics and political philosophy are distinctive in that they have a very practical intent, right? They're, they're intended at least to have a practical application. Yes. And I just didn't know whether you're so critical of these traditions because you think they ultimately produced that's why I asked you if political yeah. philosophy invented the state. Right. Um, um, are you doing political they, philosophy because you think yeah. it's caused us a lot of harm? Yeah. Well, I, I do. Uh, but it's done us some good, too. And I guess I don't th see political philosophy as driving events, usually. But it's an interaction, you know, like you have a developing social situation. It's partly represented in the philosophy. The philosophy plays back into that social situation. People find inspiration in it or even just rationalization and justification for what they're doing in it. And I think it's a really complex terrain. So I don't think that philosophy drives the political developments, but it's definitely in there, right? Like yeah. it's definitely a, one factor in those developments. And then also those developments are constantly factors in the kind of political philosophy that's emerging at a given moment. I mean, it's not yeah. just that Marx drives all these revolutions or whatever. It's also that he emerges in a particular political situation you know, and then tries to feed back into it in, in various ways. Like it's pretty complex terrain. Right. But political philosophy definitely does have real effects that a lot of, you know, metaphysics doesn't necessarily usually have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think probably it's the chapter where your own, where your own passions probably come through the strongest. Um, um, Could well be. Would, would, would it be correct to say that your primary tangible concerns in your in your sort of day, day life are political concerns at this point well, social political concerns i'm not saying you don't care about your wife or your, your kids <laughs> or whatever that's not what i mean i mean sort of more yeah. your intellectual concerns are more oriented towards the social I, and political i guess maybe day by day that's what i worry about more than most other stuff i, I wouldn't say more than aesthetics though I mean, like, actually, my girlfriend's an artist. I'm always thinking about art. I'm always in, I'm always listening to music. I'm always trying to play music and stuff like that. Like, it's just I, that you're very, much of what you're prominent for, to the extent to which you're prominent, is the, the political struggles you've been involved in. That includes the stuff at Dickinson that we promised not to talk about. Right. Um, but I just wonder to what extent, I guess, you view yourself as, politi as a political activist, maybe. And what not, the relationship is of your intellectual work to that? Not much, because I don't do what Graeber does. You know, actually, I did visit. Why not? Like, Why not? You, th uh, you think this is very, feel, you clearly think this is really important. I feel guilty about it, too. It's because, maybe because I'm kind of an individualist on a Therovian, I'm just like sort of not a joiner. And I, I, mm. real, I get really uncomfortable as soon as I'm in sort of, <laughs> uh, an organization or any kind of yeah, sort of movement. you know I, I tend to get somewhat uncomfortable uh, like I couldn't sign off on a bunch of you know positions of Occupy I'd like some of them I wouldn't like others you know I don't have a group exactly yeah. and I do feel bad about this all the time like I've tried to do some stuff just like be involved in some of the immigration issues around me and things like this I would like to do stuff and I feel like I'm I feel like a wrong person because I don't do more. But I guess my activism is, is writing, mostly. It's not yeah. that I never do, never appear at a demonstration or something, you know, but, because um, I do. But, but you write I, very sharply and intensely uh, opinionated uh, political true. pieces. True, um, and I, I guess that's my activism. That is the way you engage, yeah, yeah. And yeah. It, it's maybe because I just like sitting around my house typing and I'm more scared of going down to the demonstration or it just sounds like a hassle to me. But I hate that about myself, actually. Yeah, okay. But I don't feel quite right about it. Let's try that. Interesting. All right, well, I'm reluctant to do this, but we have to end at some point. Let me just say again, the book is Entanglements, A System of Philosophy. The author is the man I'm speaking with, Crispin Sartwell. Um, let me just say, 
I don't feel like I've done this book justice. Um, um, it is a really significant effort. Part of the problem is that I'm simply not competent to even talk about some of the stuff that's in here. I know nothing about Asian I think philosophy. Great, man. I, I could not interview you on on the Asian stuff, which is throughout this book. You were pretty wide ranging and good, man. Um, I tried, but I hope that at least people got a sense of just the vastness. The book contains multitudes. <laughs> is very well written, is very engaging, challenging. Um, I disagreed with most of it, and yet I somehow really loved it, which is very rare for me. Usually, if oh, I, usually, usually I don't love things that I, that I disagree with all of it. But um, So anyway, really good job, man. And um, Thank you. It's been great talking to you too, man. Like I hope I can tap you in the future if you don't mind. You know, always feel free to say no. But... But, you know, Massimo and I have been soldiering on for about two years, and I, I'm worried people are going to get tired of us. I'm worried we're going to get tired of each other. And so it, it, it's great if I have people I can reach out to and say, hey, you know, you want to talk about aesthetics or you want to talk about – So yeah. we you both love Danto. Maybe we can talk about Danto one day. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Crispin, thank you. Thanks, Dan. And uh, I hope to talk to you soon. Yeah. All right. All right. Take it easy. Take care. Bye.